Okay, we're recording. Good morning, Sacramento. We're here for the 2021 Virtual Harvest Day. This is our year two of Virtual Harvest Days. We're very excited to have you all here. We have three distinguished speakers and then three webinars done by Master Gardeners later in the morning. And I just wanna first thank you all for being here. Um, I know it's unfortunate that we can't be out at the beautiful Fair Oaks Horticulture Center to have our event, but given the pandemic and Unfortunately, given the smoke today, uh, it probably just would not work for us to be out there. So we are here virtually, just like last year. We're very happy to be here. And I don't want to waste a lot of time before we jump in with our first speaker. So on the website, you may have noticed that there's three videos. Fred Hoffman, otherwise known as Farmer Fred, to those of us in the Sacramento region and beyond. Um, Farmer Fred is here with us. He is the former radio show host, now podcast host with Garden Basics with Farmer Fred. But what we're gonna highlight about Fred today is he's one of our master gardeners in Sacramento County. He did a video for us all about growing food year round and cool season vegetables. So Farmer Fred, where are you? Where are you? Oh, there he is out in his garden. Farmer Fred, first tell us a little bit about where you're at. I'm in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> Good observation, Julie. Yes. Uh, let me get out of the way. I'll show you the garden. Look, there are sunflowers. There are zinnias. I love my zinnias. These are heirloom zinnias that are just doing fabulous. Uh, I have several raised beds that are either four by eight or four by four. I won't get into those details. I got a little greenhouse in the back there that you can see. And, you know, I always talk about uh, broadcasting from the Abutilon jungle. Let me show you some of the Abutilon. I'm going to turn the camera a little bit here so you can see. Uh, first of all, there is this beautiful Lida rose, which I rescued from the uh, old city cemetery in Sacramento. And then the uh, Tiger Eye Abutilon is behind there, the flowering maple, which has uh, become one of my favorite evergreen shrubs that I really like. And uh, it's uh, there's a fountain for the birds and uh, the dogs uh, like the yard, too, because there's always squirrels to chase and things like that. That's fantastic. Thanks for the quick little tour of your surroundings, Fred. And for those of you who are going to stick with us to the next presenter, those are some great examples of raised beds that Greg Gayton's going to talk to us about in about a half hour. So we have about 30 minutes with you, Fred, and we want to hit some questions about cool season crops. We have some questions to start that have come in, but the audience Attendees, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A box to submit questions to us. We will be monitoring that and pulling questions from that as we go throughout the morning. So Fred, your talk, first, I wanna start with kind of one of the big issues of the day, which is climate change. And a year ago at this time, we were talking to Carrie Reed, who's the environmental horticulture from San Joaquin, and her topic was resilience in the garden. And when you're talking about cool season crops and all these growth schedules and charts and tables and months and plant here and plant transplants there, is that gonna be affected by climate change? And do we need to worry about that with climate change? And, and what are your thoughts on that as far as cool season gardening and gardening in general and climate change? All gardening is local. Uh, I've said that for years and it's becoming more and more so. And yeah, I've definitely seen some changes. I was talking about this with Debbie Arrington yesterday from the great blog, Sacramento Digs Gardening. And there has been a certain lack of chill hours in the last decade or so that is really gonna play havoc with a lot of our favorite deciduous fruit trees. And it's not so much the reduction in chill hours during the winter, but the heat spikes that we're now getting in January and February. When you start getting three or four days in a row in January and February, but I got to tell you, it makes the people at the nurseries happy when that happens because gardeners are like insects as the temperature goes up, they head to the nursery. But when you get three or four warm days like that, those fruit trees think it's time to wake up. They put on flowers, but it's only January and February, and there are sure to be a few nights where the temperature gets down to near freezing or hailstorms or whatever that can knock the blossoms off. And when it knocks the blossoms off, that means no fruit. And that happened to me this year with my flavor Supreme Pluot. 
Yeah, I've heard from other gardeners too, who have a, had a lack of reduction in their deciduous fruit uh, production this year. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, we have to play it by ear. The other thing too, is the intense heat and sunlight. And there, we're getting more and more complaints about people with cracking tomatoes, tomatoes showing what's called solar yellowing, where it has that yellow hue to it. And maybe we have to rethink about growing vegetables in full sun and start thinking about growing our, our uh, summer loving vegetables in maybe part shade where they get some relief from the late afternoon sun. Yeah, there's a lot of factors going on here, uh, not the least of which is all this smoke. We, we forget that uh, uh, when it gets smoky, there is ash. When there is ash, there is coverage of the leaves, which means they're not photosynthesizing as well. So one thing you may want to do, if you're in a very smoky area right now, is uh, when it gets a little better, go outside and wash off your plants. Wash that ash off so that uh, the plants can get back to a normal uh, photosynthesis regime. Uh, and rain. You remember rain? I think we had some in uh, maybe. 20, 2019 or yeah. something. Uh, this is going to have this is going to have a big impact on how we garden. And if anything, mulch, 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 mulch to preserve soil moisture. It feeds the soil. Uh, it helps a lot. I, I don't know if you can see it a lot, but uh, my whole yard is mulch. It is like four to six inches of arborist tree trimmings. When I hear the, the sound of a chipper shredder in the neighborhood, I will go in search of that arborist truck and see if anybody has claimed that load of chips because I'll take them. And I think that's one reason I, I, I've stayed healthy all these years is I love to shovel mulch. So shoveling and wheelbarrowing, good exercise. Does that answer your question or you want more? No, it's perfect because you hit on a lot of the things, the smoke, the heat, the chilling hours. There's a lot of change going on. And, and the first thing you said is gardening is local and that we're just going to have to play it by ear and kind of go season to season, day to day and, and, and adjust and adapt. And I think that's a good message for everyone. We may have all these kind of really strict schedules and guides, but you're going to have to think about your own environment a little bit and maybe do a little shifting. Of well, uh, you know, for years, I have been pushing April 28th as official tomato right. planting day in Sacramento, April 28th. Your birthday. Oh, well, yeah, it just happens to be my birthday. Uh, and I still plant around that date, if not on that date. I do plant on April 28th. But over the last four or five years, there are a lot of people bragging about the tomatoes they're getting in June. And the weather has been more conducive to earlier planting. However, soil temperatures are still below what's ideal for warm weather crops. In March, soil temperatures are just barely above 50. Tomatoes like soil temperatures in the 60s and 70s. Also, look at nighttime temperatures too. Very seldom are nighttime temperatures above 50 regularly until late April. And that's a big indicator of the health of your tomato plants. So you're still taking a risk planting tomatoes and peppers early. And so, but for all those people who have had success and luck as far as weather goes and planting early, I've decided to move uh, official tomato planting day to April 1st, April Fool's Day. Do you feel lucky? Do you? Well, then go ahead, plant. <laughs> I think that's great, Fred. Um, so we have a question from somebody out there since you mentioned tomatoes. Someone wants to know about if they really want a cherry tomato or a tomato to survive over the winter. Is there any chance of that in Sacramento Valley and particular north of Sacramento? Do you have any suggestions for keeping those warm season vegetables through the winter or is that just a, a no, 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 no chance? Oh, no, you can. It, it, there's a couple of ways you can do it. First of all, especially a cherry tomato, you could grow it in a container. You know, the fabric pot containers are very conducive to moving them around, even with a large cherry tomato in them. So in the, if you grow it in a movable container, and those uh, a lot of fabric containers like the smart pot containers have handles that you can just move the pot to a warmer place, maybe the garage, maybe some next to a window would be nice. But say in October, November, Prune it back to maybe six, eight inches tall, take it to a warm spot, give it some light and uh, it, it should survive. The other option, and this would be my favorite way to do it is take cuttings of it. Start them from cuttings in September. 
put them in smaller pots in one gallon containers, and then put those cuttings in your greenhouse for the winter. Ha ha, you don't have a greenhouse. I do. Uh, <clears throat> never mind. But a greenhouse is a good investment for any gardener. And by the way, here in the Sacramento area, it's much easier keeping a greenhouse warm in the winter than it is keeping it cool in the summertime. Temperatures in that greenhouse over the last few weeks have gotten up to 120 degrees. So there's nothing going on in there. No. Uh, no, but, but a little heater, just fine. Keep the minimum temperature at 40, 45 degrees and you're fine. You could do that, like I say, with a garage, but a sunnier location would be a little bit better. And there are people now, I mean, when I was growing up in Southern California, tomatoes were and are a perennial crop. They survived from winter to winter because the temperature never got below 40 degrees. Here, the temperatures do drop below 40 degrees. So they need a modicum of protection, even moving them against the south side of the house or the west side where they get some reflected heat, maybe from a reflected patio, that tomato and your pepper plants too can survive the winter. That's great, Fred. Sheila, I hope that helped you with your tomato question. Fred just gave you a lot of good tips. And Fred, we got a, a quick sneak peek of your pups behind you while you were answering that question. So they're out there. Sully, come here, come here, Sully. Come here, come here, Sully. Yeah, um, uh, there's two here, Sully and Pepper. That's why it's called Barking Dog Studios. I love uh, it, because, I hope. Because they bark a dog. Come on up here. And when we're live like this, we have dogs and children and doorbells and gardening equipment for the neighbors. So we will roll with that. The 30 oh, pound dog. Very <laughs> say good. Say Gotta have one. garden dogs. Garden dogs are All good right. things. Yep. There Fred, you go. in your video, I remember in talking about lettuce, you mentioned that the head lettuces really are tough in the Sacramento area, but the, yeah. the loose leaf is better. Here's a question that we have coming in. Somebody's attempting to grow the Napa cabbage with the tight heading and they haven't had any luck. Do you think? there's any way to make that happen here in the Sacramento region, or is that just something that's really not gonna work? Where does someone live? Um, they just said locally. So let's just assume Sacramento. Okay, Sacramento. The problem with growing head lettuce here kind of leans to what I was talking about earlier, how we're getting heat spikes in January, February. It's, that's not gonna make head lettuce bolt. What's gonna make it bolt is the warming temperatures and longer days of March and April. Head lettuce is best for the coast. If you live on the coast, you can grow head lettuce, but it bolts too easily in our early warmth. And there, I mean, I can't think of any head lettuce variety that doesn't bolt uh, through the winter here in Sacramento. Now, prove me wrong, please. And let me know because I wouldn't mind growing a head lettuce, but frankly, loose leaf lettuce is a lot more nutritious for you and a lot prettier in a salad. And iceberg lettuce is the biggest waste of time America ever created. And that, that question came from somebody from Elk Grove. They chimed in and said they were from Elk Grove. So thank you. I think that that addresses that pretty well for them. Can I, can I uh, do a shout out for everybody who's listening who might be listening to the Garden Basics podcast and decided to tune in to see what's going on? And thank you for uh, joining us here. The Garden Basics podcast uh, is available wherever you get your podcasts. It's free. I hope you listen. That's great. And I hope they listen too. Can I plug all our sponsors too for Harvest we're gonna, Day? We're going to do that later. Okay. But if you all right. have, if, you know, we've got that scheduled in. I want, I want Q&A with you, Fred. Don't, don't start doing all this other stuff. Um, sponsors are coming up next. So stay tuned. Uh, question that ties into some of our other videos gail potpower did some marvelous videos about bale gardening straw bale gardening so we have a question about can straw bale gardening be used for winter crops and do you know of any success with that technique with winter crops ask gail <laughs> that's the easy answer we i have, have never right now though I, have, I know, but I've never grown winter crops and straw bales. I don't know. My biggest concern about that would be if it rains a lot, does that destroy the integrity of those bales? Uh, I'm sure uh, Gail has successfully grown uh, winter crops uh, in straw bales, but I got to wonder again about the rain. But I think it's worth a try. Okay, fair point. And um the person who asked that question, please send it into UC Master Gardener email and we'll get Gail on it for you. Um, Fred, with cool season crops, you mentioned that they need nitrogen or organic matter. So somebody has a question about the 
organic matter, but how do they add, they, they understand getting organic matter in there, but they're concerned about how do they get the nitrogen in there? It's like, from, you, it's from the rhizobacteria. The rhizo, if you've ever bought cover crop seed, uh, the clover, the vetch, the beans, the peas, you may have seen a little bag of inoculant next to it sitting on the nursery shelf. Inoculant is that rhizobacteria and it's just like powder. And you just basically uh, put your seeds in that bag of inoculant, shake it around a bit and then plant. And that encourages the development of rhizobacteria. Rhizobacteria actually set nodules of nitrogen on the roots of the plant. But the reason you have to inoculate it, yes, there are natural bacteria in your soil, but they're not ne necessarily nitrogen fixing bacteria. Rhizobacteria does set those nitrogen nodules on the roots of your plants. And so that's why inoculant uh, is so good for encouraging the, the setting of nitrogen in the soil. Since we're talking about nitrogen, I've learned a lot about nitrogen uh, since I've started the Garden Basics podcast. It's amazing. It's good to have a, a former college a horticulture professor uh, answering a lot of questions with me, Debbie Flower, because nitrogen wants to be a gas. And you may have nitrogen in the form of fertilizer, but if it's just laying on the surface, it's going to escape very easily. So when it comes to cover crops, what you need to do is cut down that cover crop as soon as 50% of it is in flower or less. Chop it up into small pieces, but don't let it just lay on top of your raised bed or your garden. You have to cover it with something, cover it with mulch, cover it with compost, but till it into the soil if you want to, even though I'm not a big fan of tilling, but basically get something on top of it so that nitrogen doesn't escape as a gas. It, nitrogen is the one element in our soils that's always lacking because it's so volatile and disappears so quickly. That's good information because it definitely does want to become a gas. Um, Fred, in your video, you mentioned Bt as a control for um, insects attacking broccoli. And I know in working with many people out in the public who are maybe new to gardening, they hear Bt and they have no idea what that is and how that works. Can you explain what that is a little bit and how one would go about using it or getting it and what it, how it works? Well, yeah, Bt should not be confused with the 1970s disco group Bt Express, producers of the hit record, do it, do it till you're satisfied. Or uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive, BTO, another group from the 70s. It is not. Bt, in this case, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bactericide, and it attacks only certain pests, basically pests with stomachs, like worms, like caterpillars, like uh, cabbage loopers, like tomato worms. The deal with Bt, and it is an organic product, but it works best on, shall we say, in deference to the season, it only works on small tomato worms. It's not going to kill off the big tomato worms. You're still better off uh, picking off that tomato worm and throwing it to the birds, or uh, sometimes the dogs uh, <clears throat> find them as well. You know, by the way, speaking of controlling tomato worms and cabbage loopers, it pays to have a varied garden, to have a garden with a lot of different things. And one of the best good guy hotels to have on your property are evergreen shrubs. Not necessarily flowering shrubs, they could be like bay laurel, uh, even photinia, something that the little birds like to live in year round. If you can attract a lot of little finches, a little sparrows to your yard, they provide great worm control. Another great tomato worm control are a, a species that you may think is a bad guy, but it's a good guy, and that's all the social wasps, paper wasps, and yellow jackets. I have witnessed a uh, paper wasp landing on a tomato worm, taking a big chunk out of it and flying it away to someplace and came back for more later on. So these guys like to eat on them. Also, there are beneficial wasps, parasitic wasps that lay their eggs on tomato worms. If you ever find a tomato worm with what looks like little Q-tips on its back, let leave it alone because that is the next generation of parasitic wasps. As those parasitic wasps are born, they burrow into the tomato worm and feed on the worm. And then when they're full, they fly off, the tomato worm dies and we all live happily ever after. So again, if you see a tomato worm with Q-tips on its back, uh, leave it alone. 
it's fine. But Bt is a bactericide that works specifically on worm, the Lepidopterus, if you will. And remember to don't assume anything on a product label. A lot of people do that. They think, oh, I've got this uh, malathion, if I may quote something from the past. Oh, uh, it, it says it, 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 it goes after uh, uh, white flies and aphids. I bet it, it goes after uh, tomato worms too. No, it doesn't. It won't work. And BT is the same way. You think BT will work on tomato worms and it does, but it's not gonna kill an aphid. It's not gonna kill a white fly. So as we're fond of saying in this business, read and follow all label directions. Thank you very much. Absolutely, those labels are really important. Um, uh, thanks for that. I, I love the, the, the Q-tips on the, the hornworms. That's fabulous image. So we will now be looking for that in our yard spread, thanks. Um, as far as growing potatoes, that was a great segment of your video. And a lot of people had interest in that. And I, and I hear a lot of people trying potatoes every year. I wanna try potatoes. So I think it's something of great interest. And a question, why are we cutting the seed potatoes prior to planting? Why can't they be planted whole? And you addressed in the video, but can you just kind of go over that one more time for people out there? Well, actually I never tackled in the video about why you cut, tomato, uh, cut potatoes. And so that sent me, you, you sent me that question last night and that was a good question and sent me down a rabbit hole of the internet looking for the answer. And there's a, a lot of discussion about that. Back in Maine, the state of Maine, they grow a lot of potatoes. The University of Maine has a great site on growing potatoes. Now I'm gonna to refer to my notes here because I don't wanna screw it up. Uh, go on the internet. If you're wondering about how to plant potatoes, this is the most thorough thing I've ever read. It's called Potato Facts, Selecting, Cutting and Handling Potato Seed. It's from the University of Maine. So if you just put in Potato Facts, University of Maine in your search engine, I'm sure this will come up. If I may quote them, higher total yields are generally associated with larger seed pieces, but at some point the seed piece size will not result in increased yield. Bruise problems are more severe with very large seed pieces. There is a greater cut surface area per seed piece with larger pieces. More stored energy will be used for wound healing and less is left to support new plant growth. Emergence will likely be slowed and plants will be less vigorous. A good rule is to keep the number of cut surfaces per tuber to a minimum. But to answer the question that you asked directly, uh, you, you, cut, you can plant a whole tomato. If it's a small potato, go ahead and plant it. Uh, but you're going to end up with a lot of small potatoes, and it's going to be like an underground jungle of potatoes. And again, you got the bruising factor that they talk about that could severely impact the growth of the plant. Generally speaking, according to the University of Maine, you want those cut pieces that you plant to be between 1.5 and two ounces, anywhere from two to four eyes per piece. And importantly, leave them out on the kitchen counter for one or two days to let them scar over. It makes them less susceptible to any diseases. So, uh, but there are people who say, yeah, if it's a small potato, go ahead. And by the way, you only wanna use seed potatoes, those that have been verified to not have disease. If you use grocery store tomatoes, uh, chances are you're not going to get a very healthy plant because most of them have been treated with an anti-sprouting agent. And you don't even want to use the potatoes that you grew in your garden and save them from year to year just in case you have any wilt or uh, fusarium issues uh, in your soil. So uh, always buy fresh seed potato. Generally speaking, at nurseries around here, uh, wintertime is the time that they're in the nurseries. Very good. Thanks, Fred. Um, we have a question coming in in Q&A, and I think we may need more information. So this might be a question that we need to refer to our UC Master Gardener email where somebody can really go back and forth with you. But the question is regarding tomatoes, why might the leaves on my plants be curling inward? No pests are visible. So any quick, just general thoughts about that question, Fred? Uh, two things, heat and irregular watering. Irregular water, I mean, the one thing I've learned doing 27 years answering garden questions uh, on the radio and, and on the podcast is if you say water is the problem, you're right 95% of the time. 
And irregular watering is the cause for a whole host of problems. Plants don't like boom and bust cycles of water, the, uh, the, the vegetables that you enjoy. Yes, there are some natives that don't mind it going on the dry side and then getting a drink of water, but for your vegetables that need regular watering, uh, that boom and bust cycle can lead to all sorts of diseases, including the always popular blossom and rot. Very good. Um, what about carrots that are splitting? So we have some questions, are carrots all split? There we go, the 95% rule. It's water, <laughs> it's irregular watering. That's what causes carrot split. If they start forking, that's generally a sign of heavy soil. If, if they start sp splitting a lot, now I know what you're talking about as far as the splits of that just are along the side, but if they're really bad splits, if the carrot is actually splitting in half, that could be too much nitrogen too. Very good. And we have another kind of fun question coming in. How about free range chickens for pest control? Sure, if you can keep them out of your plants. Right. <laughs> good luck. Exactly what I was thinking. If they don't eat everything you want. Yeah, um, or yeah, grow, they, grow enough for everybody. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then another question that's come in, what about, if you don't have that big yard and you only have a patio and you can only do containers, do you have some, some best tips for container gardening for, for cool season veggies or just veggies in general? Containers that have good drainage is key. And I go back to the fabric pots. Those fabric pots have a lot of great drainage and they're portable. So you can move the plant uh, to either follow the sun or maybe to preserve it on a cold night. Uh, Container gardening, it requires a, a, a different set of rules, and especially in fertilization. With containerized plants, if you follow the directions of any packaged fertilizer, it'll talk about, uh, you know, fertilize once a month, fertilize every other week. But with a container, every time you're watering, you're leaching those nutrients out. So I, I love it how Debbie Flower puts it. You want to fertilize container plants weekly, weekly meaning weekly, like every week, but weekly with the dosage cut in half. So you're gonna have to up your uh, fertilization schedule, but cut back the dosages in order to have a healthy plant. And remember too, I, the biggest problem I see with containerized plants is the lack of drainage or clogged holes. Make sure you have drain holes that are open. Make sure that pot is sitting on some boards or bricks or something to allow those drain holes not to get into contact with soil. Because if you got soil meeting where that drain hole is, the roots of your plant in the container are gonna find that and go down into the soil and you've lost your drainage. So muddy soil, if, you, if you've got a mysterious problem with your containerized plants, dig down, check out that soil at the bottom. If it's soggy, you need to improve the drainage. If it smells bad, you really need to improve the drainage. Yeah, that should never smell bad. That's a big indication there's an issue. Um, Fred, if you just had to pick your top handful of cool season plants that a beginner would most likely have some easy success with, what would you send people out to think about for this fall and winter? Greens. Greens are easy. Greens are, aren't too particular about sun or shade. In fact, if you have a mostly, if you have that small yard, chances are you have a lot of shade. Start with the greens. They don't require that much sunlight because they are not producing fruiting bodies and flowers. So chard, loose leaf lettuce, spinach, bok choy, pak choy, joy choy, uh, all of those. The greens are a great way to go. They're very versatile. I like to eat most of those raw. People like to saute them as well. But uh, during uh, the fall and winter and spring, uh, every night we're having a salad made from something green from the garden. Uh, it doesn't, of course, match with what we have now, <laughs> but still it's greens. When you start getting into the world of broccoli and cauliflower, uh, there is more disappointment looming, but go ahead and try, especially if it's a sunny location, it's gonna have more pest problems too. Generally speaking, the biggest problem, pest problem with leafy greens might be leaf rollers. And that's where that BT would come into play, but actually just getting out in your garden and walking your garden every day and 
checking closely, not just the fronts of the leaves, but the backs of the leaves can warn you of impending doom, of impending pest damage. So carry a watering can with you or, or a garden hose. And when you see those pests, just wash them off, just wash them off. And then finally, if somebody just, just really wants that, that summertime tomato type garden and doesn't want to deal with the fall and winter, I think what you said in your video is really important. You could still consider a cover crop. And if that even feels like too much, then mulch, mulch, mulch. So oh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Mulch, mulch, mulch. I want to talk about how the people in this neighborhood of suburban purgatory love me because I want to rake up their oak leaves. And in the fall, I'm out there, I'm grabbing up uh, garbage cans full of their oak leaves and bringing them back here and then either grinding them up with a weed whacker or putting them under a mulching mower and making them into smaller pieces. And I will top all my beds with that pile of leaves, eight inches, 12 inches deep. And if the bed's empty, it doesn't matter how deep it is. And that will slowly break down. It feeds the soil. It keeps weeds from germinating in there during the winter as well. And it just provides a whole host of good and it's free and your neighbors love you. Absolutely. Farmer Fred Hoffman, you are an institution for the Sacramento region and beyond. You are a beloved master gardener with us and we love having you kick off Harvest Day, whether it's live or virtual. And I know this is not your favorite format, but it was awesome to have the time to chat with you. Your video is fabulous. For anyone who hasn't watched Fred's video, please go to our YouTube site to watch his video. And everyone, please know that this is being recorded and it will be linked up and put out on our Master Gardener YouTube link next week once we get a chance to pull it all together and post it. So if you hey. missed the beginning, if you're a little late, you still can hear what Fred told us all um, at the beginning today. Fred? What, one more thing about the Cool Season video. There will be a part two uh, coming to YouTube uh, in September. And thanks to Kathy Stewart and Mary Welch for putting those videos together. They did a fabulous job. Yes. Well, thank you, Fred Hoffman. We appreciate your time and your amazing gardening information. So, And thank you, Dave Wilson Nursery, uh, Kellogg Garden Products, and Green Acres Nursery for helping sponsor Harvest Day. Absolutely. So in sponsoring Harvest Day, I am going to actually focus on that now. We have some amazing Harvest Day sponsors that we want to acknowledge. We have community partners, the Fair Oaks Recreation and Park Districts, the Sacramento Bee. We have a bunch of Harvest Gold sponsors, Sacramento Urban Valley Urban Forest Council, GMB Organics, Sacramento Stormwater Utility, Emerald Point, RWA, SMUD, Green Acres. Then we have Green Thumb sponsors, Blooming Business sponsors, and Web sponsors. And we could not have our Harvest Day without all these fabulous sponsors. And I also want to thank Judy McClure, our amazing Master Gardener coordinator, who helps us behind the scenes with all things Master Gardener. And of course, Fred mentioned them, Kathy Stewart and Mary Welch, who are our Harvest Day coordinators and our video gurus for our program. They have been amazing in once again, pulling off a virtual Harvest Day for us this year. So we wanna thank them. And I would like to just say one other thing about Harvest Day and the Master Gardener program. Harvest Day isn't the only thing we do. We also have plant clinics. We also have speakers bureaus. We have our website with lots of videos and lots of informational materials. So the Master Gardener Program is here to educate the community on gardening. And we have a lot of ways to do that, but we cannot do that without your help and your participation in our events and in the different things that we are doing out there in the world. So one thing I wanna say is that please go to our website and on the website, there are, sorry about that, there is a link for um, Make a Gift. And we're always using fundraising to help us expand our educational opportunities out there. We have um, also our sponsors, SMUD is one of our sponsors. And SMUD has continually been a strong supporter of the Master Gardener program and regional efforts that we do. So I have a short video that I would like to share with you from SMUD that we wanna show as a little commercial. 
It's very short. Here we go. In 2030, in just nine years, I'll be 18. Off to college, probably getting my own place. I want to live where the air is fresh. Where they take care of the planet. I want to live in the best city, the cleanest city. I want to live in a clean power city. By 2030, SMUD will be 100% carbon free, so you can live in a clean power city. Join the charge at cleanpowercity.org. So thank you, SMUD, for being an uh, ongoing and continual sponsor for the Master Gardener program here in Sacramento County. We have about five minutes until we're going to start with Greg Gayton. And so I would like to give everybody a few minutes to take a quick break. Um, please come back in five minutes at 910 and we will get started with Greg, who's talking about raised beds. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box for us. All right, we will be back. Hey, Greg. 
So welcome back, everyone. I hope you're returning from grabbing another cup of coffee or a little snack or any other breaks you might have needed. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment with Greg Gayton from Green Acres Nursery. Um, first, before we even begin talking with Greg, I have to thank Greg profusely. Greg has been a continual and very special supporter of the Sacramento County Master Gardeners program for many, many years, and so has Green Acres. So Greg is the Green Acres Nursery and Supplies California Certified Nursery Professional. Um, he is wearing his Green Acres garb today, hat, shirt, you can't mistake him or forget that he's with Green Acres. And I want to remind everybody, Green Acres is a sponsor for us. They almost always are, and they've just been delightful to work with over many, many years. So thrilled to have Greg here. Um, Greg also did a video for us that's been up on our website about raised beds, um, why choose raised beds. His video was great, um, lots of good tips in there. And Greg, I know I, I talked to you a little bit through email in the past couple of days. We're getting a lot of questions about soil and compost and amendments, and then kind of another set of questions about trellising and, and kind of going up that vertical aspect of raised beds. So I think we'll start in that area if that's okay with you. Would that be sure. okay? All of right. course. Welcome. Um, and we also are getting some live questions again about soil and compost and that type of thing. So we'll start there. Do we have to rejuvenate the raised bed soil every year or is compost and mulch enough to provide the organics? Any tips or thoughts on that? Oh yeah, you want to increase the organics in your yard, in your raised bed each year. Uh, you want to increase the biology. You want to make sure that you have, the, the soil is the most important part, most important aspect of growing a successful vegetable garden or flower garden or cut flower garden or whatever you're growing in your raised bed. And so you definitely want to add layers to it each year that actually adds more biology to the soil where you get more earthworms, um, just the plants thrive in that type of situation. So definitely each year you wanna add more and more. All right, and is there ever a point where it's just not gonna work where you need to haul out what's in there and replace it with new? We've had that question too. Well, you know, it, it just depends on, um, you know, sometimes you just need to pull out if you've got a lot of roots uh, mass in there, you can clean out, add more soil, more organics to it. That's what you want to do. But, you know, just adding more organic matter is, is really the key to a, a healthy garden. And once the plants are established, do you have any recommendations for the best fertilizers to use and the frequency of use in the raised beds? Well, of course, I only recommend using organics. Organics are the way to go. Um, you know, they add much needed beneficial fungi to the soil. Um, they don't burn, they help the plants um, with taking this heat. Um, they don't add salts. They don't cause um, really fast growth. Organics are really the way to go. As far as, you know, you there's different types of organics and you wanna read them, follow the directions. Um, I usually for, use my, my granulars, uh, uh, my, those I usually use about once a month. Um, liquids usually about once a week or so, but you want to really follow the directions on the label. Perfect. And, and to go back to prepping and rejuvenating soil, what do you think about cover crops in raised gardens? Same cover crop. You know, that's a great question. If you're not gonna be planting a vegetable garden in the winter time, cover crops are fantastic, like crimson clover, uh, fava beans. Um, you know, what they do is they help fixate nitrogen. Um, they are green manure. So um, if you're not gonna be growing a winter vegetable crop, then, you know, by all means, put cover crops in there. You can't go wrong, the added organics. Um, it's just fantastic. You're, you're gonna be beg people to take your tomatoes uh, if you do that next, you know, the next summer. Do you have a favorite cover crop? I like crimson clover. You know, it looks great during the winter time. Um, you know, you can incorporate into the soil um, in the springtime, but it just grows quickly, does really well in our climate. I, that's my favorite is crimson clover. And I do use it if I get lazy in one of my raised beds and just don't want to plant anything in the winter time. That's awesome. And that ties into what Fred told us too previously, you know, do something in that bed 
over the winter, yes. put a cover crop oh, yes. in or thick, thick, thick mulch, something. Um, so crimson clover. And when you're ready to plant for the spring summer, you would just turn that into the soil. Is that what Jack Definitely. Said? Yeah, that's your green manure. You definitely want to turn it into the soil. Um, and uh, you can't buy anything better than that. Um, so definitely, you know, your, your raised beds, um, gardens, they're not just for the summertime when you're planting, they're throughout the year. You can, you know, they're, they're, they're preferably placed in an area where you can see them all the time. So you want it to make it look great, but you also want to add nutrients and soil and, and just keep them going. They're a living, component of your yard. So uh, definitely, if you're not planting a winter vegetable garden, you know, definitely plant uh, cover crops. Great. So we do not necessarily have to replenish soil or replace soil every year, but we need to replenish it with good organics. Good cover crops turned into it is another good idea. What about when you're just starting out? You put up your braised bed fixed platform and now you need to add the soil in. Do you have a recommendation for the best soil blend to start out with or how to start that planter out? Well, you know, when you, you know, and there's so many soils out there, you know, you can look at the bag and, you know, be dazzled by it. But I, I like to look at samples, be able to grab them. If you can grab them and you can make an indentation in the soil, it's loose enough that um, it does fall off, but it's, it's strong enough so that it makes, it's heavy in your hand. That's a great soil because it's, it will be there enough aeration so that the water will get through, but also hold moisture too. So soil is really important. When you go out and you look for a proper soil, make sure that you feel it and, and touch it and grab it. And, and most nurseries allow you to do that. There are always some samples there, but all soils aren't the same. So make sure that you, you don't just be dazzled by the bag. Look at it and feel it and, and um, you know, test it. I love that. Don't get bedazzled by the bag. Um, get your hands dirty. And, and exactly. let's, let's plug Green Acres. You guys have little containers where you can really touch and see the soils, right? Yeah, that's really important because a lot of bags, you can't see through them. You can't see the soil. And so it's very important to fill it in your hands and work with it. You know, it's great to get dirty. <laughs> um, grab that soil, fill it. If it's going to retain moisture or it's going to um you know there's going to be good aeration so that there's good drainage that's really important so you definitely want to fill the texture of the soil and and you know that's that's the key is is the soil is the most important compact component to your raised uh, bed garden absolutely that's got to be there first um that leads right into this other really great question um one of our listeners is saying that their raised bed soil is loose and drains really easily to the point where it often dries down to three or four inches really quickly. Is the soil too loose and needs some amendments or some, some different aspects to it? So is there, can it, can it get too loose? They sure can. So, you know, components like earthworm castings laid on top of it, or the mulch that you, um, the organic mulch that you produce in your, you know, with your household, um, waste and your garden waste is fantastic to put on top of that. Different layers of different types of amendments always help out. You know, um, that will actually help retain moisture. You've got the great base below that. So putting mulch on top of that will retain the moisture. And, and like the earthworm castings, which are fantastic. Um, so, you know, go with earthworm castings, mulch. Um, you can, all organic matter is great as far as adding to your raised bed garden. They all filter in, they all create little zones in there and help with, uh, with drainage and aeration. So with our, that last question, with his loose soil, if you're adding earthworm castings or other types of organics, do you wanna just leave them as a layer or do you wanna turn them in and then put the mulch on top? I, you know, studies have shown that layering is really the best way, um, you know, layering, um, you're not, you're not going to disturb the organisms, the beneficial organisms in the soil. You're not going to mess up the, the beneficial fungi. So layering is the way to go. Tilling um, will bring more air into it. You're going to have to water more often. Um, you know, um, there's going to be more diseases and pests. So definitely layering is the way to go, definitely. And then always just think about not overdoing it with one thing in particular, like maybe coffee grounds you want to keep to a certain percentage. You don't want to put 
too much coffee grounds in the area that can make it too acidic and change the texture and the soil make up a little too harshly. So you want to balance. And then somebody's saying chicken pellets and alfalfa pellets as fertilizers. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, you know, just be careful. Chicken can be really, really, really hot. So, you know, be careful. One of the great things about having a garden or a raised bed garden is experimentation, but um, don't go overboard. Um, alfalfa is fantastic. Uh, I use not only in my raised bed gardens, but I use around my established plants. Alfalfa um, helps nitrogen, um, you know, the plant excess nitrogen. And so go for it. I love, uh, I like ex experimentation, but like I said, don't go overboard. Yeah, finding a good balance is always yes. key. Um, with raised beds, we had a question about fusarium and varicillium. And, and when you have a problem like that, how do you treat the soil going from one season to the next? You have to get rid of the soil. So what do you do when those kind of issues crop up in your raised beds? Well, that's a tough one. Um, you know, those soil borne uh, pathogens are really difficult to get rid of. Um, you want to make sure that you follow really um, clean procedures uh, when you're using your garden, when you're working in your garden, you know, cleaning your tools, um, you know, just keeping weeds at bay, um, you know, so basically um, there's really, the only thing I can suggest is like soil uh, solarization which helps, um, but you got to get the soil hot enough. And we're not really sure if that's really going to take care of a lot of those, uh, those problems or kill those pathogens off like a fusarium and verticillium. So um, what you want to do is unfortunately you have to move towards more uh, resistant varieties of, of vegetables. Um, and, you know, if you have, you can always put pots of desirable plants outside your raised bed garden that are susceptible, but um, solar solarization is usually about one of the only ways you can really combat those uh, soil borne problems. And if, if anybody wants more in-depth information about these things or solarization, again, the Master Gardener website has some great resources for you. So go to the website, do a little search, and you'll probably get a lot of different information that you can add to what Greg's saying. And you can always send in your questions directly to the Master Gardeners if you just want to go deeper into any of the questions we're talking about this morning. Because, of course, we only have 30 minutes. So just always oh, remember that. And we um, utilize the Master Gardeners all the time. Uh, we work in collaboration with them. We we love working with them. I work actually with, besides Sacramento, Placer County, and El Dorado County, Master Gardeners, you're all, uh, you're all our people. That's why we love Greg Gayton and Green Acres. <laughs> we do. We have a marvelous relationship, and we're really happy about that. Thanks, Greg. Um, let, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about bigger critters raccoons, squirrels, um, gophers. Some people are concerned about that with their raised beds. And there's, is there anything you can do when building a raised bed to try and prevent those from becoming a problem? Or once you have an established raised bed, something you can do to prevent those larger mammalian um, friends in the wilderness from coming and taking all your goodies? Oh, most definitely. Um, you know, you want to actually line your beds. A lot of people in the past use chicken wire, but, um, you know, there's a lot of voles in that that actually can get through there. So garden cloth is really uh, preferred. Um, it's actually a hardware cloth, and that will help keep some of the critters going. You want to make sure that you overlap, like at least a hand um, size if you you know so that the whole bed is filled and make sure you put it on the sides of the bed as well so that the critters can't get inside it um you know there's raccoons and skunks and you know there's there's great little detectors that you can hook to your hose so that they're gonna once they come out there they're gonna shoot a spray of water to them i know my neighborhood uh cats love my raised bed gardens um i also put chicken wire on top of the corners of my beds. I know a lady at one of my uh, gardens who actually puts pine cones in there so that the cats won't dig in there because once they touch that, it's a problem. So yeah, there's a lot of little critters that can go into it. So I use the hardware cloth on the bottom and on the sides. Uh, I'll use chicken wire if there's neighborhood cats on the edges. Um, and I actually do have one of the water 
um, patrolling robots so that when anything comes into my garden, it'll spray it and zap it. And, you know, once they usually get zapped, they usually don't come back. So uh, right, right. that's a lot of fun. Yeah. And sometimes it's just trial and error. You know, you just yes. keep trying a different thing and, and hope and pray that you wake up in the morning and they've stayed away. <laughs> so <laughs> I know I, I want to go out there sometimes and sleep with my flashlight and go out there and say, hey, you nasty varmints, stay away. You know? yeah. Bring my 100 pound golden retriever out there with me and, uh, you know, have fun with it. But unfortunately, you know, you're planting your raised bed garden. It's such a beautiful environment and not only for humans, but the critters are always uh, bound to come in and take a look at that. Absolutely. Um, another great question. And I know that Farmer Fred mentioned it in his video about cool season gardening is you wanna rotate in your garden. You don't wanna plant the same thing. Is that also true of your raised beds that you wanna rotate your crops? Almost definitely. You know, and I've, I've humbled myself um, throughout the three or four years that I've had a raised bed garden, um, just because I found that placement is really crucial. And I do rotate my, I'll put tomatoes on one end and one year and then put them on the other end. I'll change my peppers. Uh, it's really crucial that you do that. Yeah. And then yeah. An, a question about desired depth. So I know in the video, you're like four feet across, so you can reach everything. What about depth? Well, depth is really important. Um, it depends on what you're growing. Uh, if you're going to be putting in carrots or beets, you want at least 24 um, you know, as the, the depth is really important. So the farther down you go, the better it is um, for that root system to expand and, and pull out. You get a little four inch plant from the nursery too. And you see that and it looks really cute, but you realize that the root system is gonna eventually take up. So you wanna at least have 24, you know, 30 inches depth, definitely. Yeah. And then just whatever's comfortable for you. If you're doing yes. it for your own ambulatory needs, if you need it higher, go higher, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And you learn. You learn. Uh, like my first year, I did everything crazy. I didn't follow anybody. I just went on instinct. And I've learned so much just by talking with fellow master gardeners and fellow um, plant nerds like myself. And you realize that, you know, that's the one great thing about raised beds. You can, you can manipulate them. You can change them. You can add more depth to them. You can make them wider. You can make them narrower. Um, that's the beauty of it. That's fantastic. Um, another theme that came out in many of the questions is about having trellising or vertical nature to the raised beds or structures for sunshades. So any tips or thoughts about trellising and vertical and sunshade structure? Yeah, well, trellising, you know, gives you optimum um, usage of your garden. Um, you know, like for example, you know, the old fashioned tomato cages are great for keeping your peppers and your tomatoes from flopping over. But like what I do is I'll put a trellis on each side and grow my beans and my peas up them. Um, you, if you have a couple of raised beds, you can put like gateways across so they connect and you can grow vines across them. Mm -hmm. You know, we put up their massive uh, raised guard, uh, bed gardens at Cap Public Radio, but we actually, on, on two of them, we put a gate, uh, archway across and we grew kiwi plants on them. After um, a couple of years, one season, we had over 500 pounds of kiwi and that was in a raised bed garden. Wow. So, you know, it, 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 you know, you can have different sizes of them. I've seen like people grow at a 45 degree angle. Um, you can put like a little tiny um, like trellis and, and then have it supported up, grow cucumbers under that. It gives enough shade that you can put lettuce underneath it so it doesn't go to bulk. Um, there's so many different ways. Trellising is really important. You can grow, you can put trellises in there. You can have support so you can grow melons up the trellis. You can really put a lot of uh, different uh, um, crops in your raised bed garden by using trellis. So, um, you know, that's another thing to experiment. I noticed that the uh, beautiful Fair Oaks garden, they actually even had a ladder and they were growing things up. So be creative. You can put 
obelisk in there and grow things up at, you know, um, I turned my raised bed gardens into a work of art and trellises have helped, um, you know, put that in motion. So people come by and look at them. I've even painted some of them different colors and have a lot of fun with it. That's fantastic. That is a great thought to have, make it a work of art and go yes. visit places and Google things and get ideas of how you can, you know, make your gardens pop with interesting ladders or obelisks, like you said, that's fabulous. What about sun protection? There's a question about, is a structure needed when you're using a sunshade? So, or, or can you just throw it over a plant directly? Well, a structure is needed and you want to make sure that you, you know, don't pick a sunscreen that's too heavy. 50% or more is great for humans, but it's too much shade for crops. Um, you know, your frost cuff, uh, cloth cover that you use in the wintertime works really well. Make sure that it's high enough so that it doesn't retain the heat below it. You want to make sure that there's um, good ventilation on the sides. So like a lot of people will get sun scald on their tomatoes or their peppers. If that's the case, if it's facing west, put like a cover over it. Just make sure that it's elevated enough so good air circulation is around it and it's not too dense so that sun can get through it because there is, um, you know, it did definitely need to be put, you know, sun through it. So like your frost uh, cloth that you use in the wintertime is perfect for that. That's a good tip. I like that. Um, what What's going on at Green Acres these days that you want to highlight for us since you've got an, a captive audience? <laughs> well, I'm actually at the Sacramento store. I started here, gosh, 42 years ago. Um, this week we're having dog days of summer. We just... Uh, you know, we have seven locations. We have a lot of fun here. We have a lot of plant nerds. We actually have a couple of Sacramento County master gardeners that work for us. Um, we love the master gardeners and um, we just, we're just lots of things happening. Uh, but dog days is this week. So people bring their dogs in and we show them about, uh, uh, you know, pet friendly plants and pet friendly products. Uh, a lot of them, we follow the University of California Integrated Pest Management. Um, you know, that's something that we utilize a lot here. Most of our staff uh, receives the newsletters um, from, um, you know, UCIPM. So um, you guys are fantastic. You offer us a great, great um, help. We feel like we're definitely partners and colleagues with you. That's fabulous. We feel the same about you guys. Um, any, do you have anything that you talked about in your video that you want to highlight for the people listening in who maybe didn't get to see the video before? Any tips? Well, the tip is, you know, you want to make sure that you put your raised bed garden where you can see it on a, on a daily basis. Um, don't just plant it and forget about it. You want to go out and visit it daily. Uh, you want to check for insects. You want to make sure that watering is, uh, especially in this year when we have such a low water year, you want to make sure that your, your drip system is working or if you're using soaker hoses, uh, they're working well. Um, you want to check for those wonderful tomato hornworms. Um, you know, I also, I like to plant uh, flowers that bring in beneficials and pollinators. And so when you're out there, um, you know, those, you know, like 90% of the insects that are out there are beneficials. So you want to attract more and more beneficial insects. So you're going to have to deadhead those on a regular basis. Um, you know, just check your garden daily, have fun, get your hands dirty, get inspired, um, you know, look at other people's gardens, um, just have fun. You're going to realize like, me, for example, I had so many tomatoes, I was actually just putting buckets on my neighbor's porches. Um, they're going, oh God, here comes Greg, the, the tomato dude. Um, I, you know, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm worried that somebody's gonna start throwing tomatoes at me. And that's the big thing is I've learned so much and the raised bed gardens have afforded me a more productive garden. And so um, I can't get enough of them. Like I said, I have three of them. 
Well, I'd like to be your neighbor. I'll take a bucket delivery anytime. Um, I'd be happy to. In fact, um, you know, Kathy, and I, we were, I was giving them tomatoes when we were filming this. So uh, oh, fantastic. amazing. We had such a great time. That's great. And your mentioning of flowers mixed with veggies came right at the same time as a question popped up about do mixes of flowers and veggies benefit each other in a raised garden? And oh, they yeah. sure do. You know what I do? What I have a lot of fun is this year on one of my raised beds, I put uh, uh, sunflowers in back. I had different heights of sunflowers. Um, early in the season, I planted gladiolus bulbs and the hummingbirds, I, I put those on the side. The hummingbirds were wonderful. And hummingbirds, besides pollinating, they actually go after, they need protein, so they eat the aphids. Um, but also I was, the gladiolus bulb, um, flowers produce flowers that I cut off and gave to the neighbors as well. I, I love my neighbors. Um, and so, you know, by planting gladiolus and, uh, blanket flowers and cosmos and, and, you know, borage to bring the bees in and, and that you're, you're having a very productive garden. Um, you can have cut flowers. Um, your, your vegetables are being pollinated, um, and you're adding, you know, you're, you're taking carbon out of the, the atmosphere. You're, it's just a win, win, win situation. And it looks beautiful. And like I said, I, I think my raised bed gardens are beautiful and it's a, it's a, you know, a statement. I, I think it's one of the, the prettiest parts of my yard. Well, you heard that folks, borage, gladiolas, cosmos, sunflowers, add those flowers in because they're going to bring those beneficial insects into your yes. garden, pollinators into your garden, and it's going to be great. Um, we have just a few more minutes, so I do want to give you a chance to add anything you'd like to add in, Greg, um, to highlight, again, anything at Green Acres, to encourage anyone who's maybe never done this before, any closing Greg Gaten, Green Acres thought. <laughs> well, you know, ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, most of our staff are qualified and, you know, bring in samples. Um, don't just assume that every insect out there is, uh, is bad. Um, you know, get to know your garden, work your soil, um, feel it. It's not, you know, Get dirty, um, only use organics. Organics are the key. Make sure that you add um, layer mulch, earthworm castings um, for good drainage. You're not gonna have weed problems anymore. And also it's really important around your raised bed gardens, make sure that you keep the weeds at bay there too. Put down some cardboard and mulch on top of them. It's amazing that when the weeds pop up, you can pull them out. But as far as Green Acres goes, we, we're, you know, we're, we're just plugging along. We're having a lot of fun with, you know, ask a lot of questions, um, you know, come on in, bring your dogs this week. Uh, we love dogs anytime. I've actually had a lady bring in a goat. Um, we give free bandanas that we give to everybody. Um, you know, if you have a dog, um, we just, uh, we're local, we're family owned and, um, you know, we live here too. We're part of the community and we love uh, teaming up with Master Gardeners. I've had a lot of fun with all of you. And Judy McClure um, is fantastic. Everybody in the Sacramento Master Gardeners are great. I know a ton of you all, uh, love you all, and you're just fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We had a question pop up um, sure. when, we, when we mentioned all those kind of summertime uh, flowering plants. Do you have any suggestions for wintertime pollinator plants for the garden? Well, you know, in the wintertime, I fill my garden with nasturtiums. I put out, um, you know, pansies and violas. Um, you can put out, uh, you know, they're not really, a lot of the pollinators aren't out at that time, but, you know, you can, the, the nasturtiums, the sweet peas, mm grow well in the winter time um you know you can have your garden look beautiful year round and they're also helping the garden flourish uh, your soil flourish they're adding organic components to the ground um the soil so yeah winter time plant nasturtiums plant sweet peas uh um you know make it look beautiful plant that cover crop in there with uh, crimson clover everything's going to help out 
And that's great. And of course, when people start hearing we only have a few minutes left, some questions start pouring in. So what about tree roots invading raised beds? Any, any suggestions for that? Saws all? No. <laughs> 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 well, unfortunately, there's really, you know, um, do you want to plant, put your garden, your raised bed gardens away from any major trees? Uh, if the tree roots come up, boy, you're just going to have to dig and pull them up. You know, that's a question for the master gardeners or the um, Green Acre staff. You can, you know, come on in, say what kind of tree you have. Um, you know, tree roots are really important for the health of a tree. You don't want to cut roots off that are going to impair that tree's growth or cause it to decline. So, you know, that's a, you know, find out what kind of trees you have and that's, um, you know, what kind of roots are going in there, but that's going to uh, definitely be a problem. So keep your raised bed gardens away from many major trees. Absolutely. And then if there is, uh, I think what you're saying about don't go hacking at your tree roots. The tree needs those roots. So if you do start having that problem, get some advice from the master gardeners, green acres, a certified arborist before you kill the tree. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, and trees are having a tough time this year with, uh, you know, with the slow water year. They didn't get a lot of rain in the winter time, and um, you definitely don't want to. Uh, you know, the roots are really important. They take the water and nutrients up into the tree. They make the tree nice and healthy and you don't wanna impair that. So it, placement of your raised bed garden is really important. Um, so you know, keep that in mind when you're putting it out there that if there are trees that have big roots, keep it away from that area. Absolutely. Well, Greg Gayton, you are a treasure again to the Master Gardener Program and Green Acres are just fabulous nurseries to go visit locally. And we encourage all our attendees and others watching this video later to connect with our sponsor, Green Acres. And maybe you'll even see Greg out there someday when you go. Oh, visit. yeah. So. Say hello, please. I, I, I'm not shy. Come on up. But bring your dog. I give him a, a little tiny Green Acres uh, scarf for him. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Oh, we, I had a really great time and I'm here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to come to the store and ask me. And again, thank you again, Master Gardeners. You're, you're amazing. You're such a great um, part of our community and what you do is just amazing. Well, we couldn't do it out, do all this work without great support and sponsors like you. So thank you, Greg. Thank you for all our attendees and, and um, you, you've given us some great things to think about with raised beds and I hope everybody tries it out. So, bye, thank you. Um, I would like, we're, we have um, Bill Cresha coming up in a few minutes, but before we get to Bill, I wanna take us on a bit of a journey with something that um, Greg mentioned, which is the IPM website. So we as master gardeners are part of the UC Agriculture and Nat Natural Resources group. And on their page, ipm.ucanr.edu, you can go and investigate all sorts of pest management issues that you might be having in your garden, in your landscape. It's a great resource. So I would definitely tag that and go there and, and figure out how to, how to manage things in a very productive and non-damaging way for the environment. So Integrated Pest Management Program is what IPM is about. And then I also wanted to share with you our Master Gardener website, and our Master Gardener website, you can find all sorts of information on all the topics to the left, herbs and berries and beneficials and insects and orchard. But you can also find information about our gardening guide and calendar. You can find information about our, our Fair Oaks Horticulture Center. So at the Fair Oaks Horticulture Center, we have been closed most of the past 15 to 16 months because of the pandemic. But we do now have the well garden, the water efficient landscape garden back open. It's open from sunup to sundown. So maybe some of you have gone out there and strolled through the well garden of late. And we encourage you to do that, get ideas for water efficient landscaping. As far as getting back beyond the well garden into the orchard and the vineyard areas and the veggie areas, that's been pretty much closed. But we are going to have, drum roll please, 
our Fair Oaks Horse Culture Center open garden scheduled for September 11th from nine in the morning until 11. This will be a time when the public can come out to the garden, they can stroll around, there will be a bunch of master gardeners out and about with masks, taking care of pandemic um, concerns and answering your questions and guiding you through and showing off the garden. With that is scheduled again on Saturday, September 11th from nine to 11. If there is anything that prevents us from holding that, any changes in our pandemic situation locally or I don't know, say a horrible smoky day where we don't want people out. Um, it will be posted on the website and our Facebook page. So you can watch out for those places to see if there is any last minute change to that. But right now we're really excited to have an open garden on September 9th and we hope you come out and join us. Um, otherwise that IPM site along with this master gardener site, great place to go and get more information. So I just wanted to highlight those. And then before we jump into our talk with Bill, we have a poll that I'm gonna launch right now. So those of you who are online, you should see pop up on your screen, poll number one. We have two questions that we'd love for you who are attending to us today, attending with us today to answer. Um, one question, have you explored growing new and or different vegetable varieties during the past 24 months? We have some multiple choice answers there. And then during the past 24 months, have you visited the UC IPM website for pest management help? And we have a yes or no, or no, I just learned about the site from Julie options. Uh, and I see some people are starting to answer or the, the results are ticking up. So I'm gonna give you a few seconds to um, answer those poll questions as you see them. We're up to 23 responses, that's great. There's over 50 of you though, so come on, let's answer the poll question. You should see it on your, on your screen. Two quick questions. Why are we asking you poll questions? There's gonna be three of these during the morning. Um, it's so we can get information about what we might need to emphasize in our educational outreach in the coming year. So it helps us know where the public's interest is, where what you're thinking about as far as the 51 of you who are with us today, we'd like to have that information. We're up to 31, 20 more people. Come on, take the poll for us, please. Even master gardeners, I know there's some master gardeners who are attendees, don't be shy, take the poll too. Um, we just want that feedback. So we have um, three videos on our website for our speakers today. We have a Fred Hoffman video um, about cool season crops. We have Greg Gaynor, who you just heard from talking about raised beds. And we have Bill Cresha talking about jazz about citrus. But I also wanna highlight, we have a, a welcome to Harvest Day video done by um, uh, Matt and Terry Van Airsdale, hysterical. Um, great cameo by Matt and lovely intro and welcome by Terry. So I would encourage you to check that out. And then at the bottom, there's a, a splattering of some other videos that the Master Gardeners have been busy making about straw bale gardening. Gail Pothauer did a couple about blueberries, about um, protecting your fruit trees, uh, other ones that I'm not thinking of right now because I don't have the screen up, but there's about five to six to eight videos there that really good information. Make sure you check them out. Um, oh, uh, one about landscape design, which is really good. Get great information about converting your landscape to more water efficient. Um, so really great videos there. Check those out when you get a chance. So I'm just gonna give the poll about one more minute. So if you're here, if you're back from your, your coffee break or your run to the bathroom break, there's a poll up on your screen. Please give us some, some answers to the two questions, really quick answers. And I will, um, I believe I can share the poll. Well, I will, I'll do it verbally if I can't do it visually, but we'll share the poll results um, in about one more minute. So you have one more minute to get that polling done. And then I will introduce our next guest who's gonna be talking about citrus. I think from what I hear, he's pretty jazzed about citrus. Um, so we'll be going there in just a moment. We're up to 39 poll takers. Excellent. The countdown's starting. We're gonna close out this poll here, folks. So have you explored growing new and or different vegetables varieties during the past 24 months? A whopping 85% of you 
have said, yes, you've explored growing new and different vegetables. That's awesome. I hope you continue to explore. And to those of you who haven't had interest or haven't thought about it or didn't have time, I hope that changes for you in the coming year and, and these talks inspire you to try something, even if it's a cover crop, try something. And then during the past 24 months, have you visited the UCIPM website? Um, again, a whopping 80%. So we have a, a attendee group that's very in the know about the UC IPM website. For those of you who just learned about it today or have never used it, I hope you find that as a great resource in the coming year and years to come to try and diagnose and figure out ways to manage your, your pest problems in a, a very productive way. So let's end that poll. And I can quickly share those results. So you should see those popping up on your screen. Don't think there's a great need to keep it up long. The percentages were high that we have visited UC IPM and we have uh, explored gardening. So we have, we have a good group here. All right, let's go to round three of our um, sessions this morning. We have Bill Cresha with us. Hey, Bill, can you unmute and let's make sure your mic's working okay. I have this great fear of Mike's not working. Mike's not working. Bill's not working either. Bill and the mic are both Bill's here. Awesome. So um, Bill Kresha is a master gardener. We actually started the same year. We went through training together. We had a great group of people go through that training many moons ago now. Um, so I'm thrilled to have Bill talk to us. Bill's full of energy and is jazzed about citrus among many other things with gardening. He's, he's, he's usually energetic and jazzed about stuff. And I would like to say that I loved um, the kind of catch that you threw in your video about take action or chill. Because I think that's so true in what we do in the garden. Sometimes you need to take that immediate action. Sometimes you just need to stink and chill and just let, let things see themselves out. So do you want to just quickly in a general way address? I, I oh, oh, sure. I, I, I think one, one of the, uh, the key things is recognizing when you do have to take action and, and recognizing just like, oops, sorry about that. Um, when you need to chill and some of the things like when we talked about citrus leaf miner, freak people out. I mean, it, it passed harvest days. You could almost tell people were coming in with branches off their citrus tree uh, with all these gnarly leaves with cool tunnels in them and everything else. And it's like, well, you know, I sprayed it with this. And it's like, no, no, man, chill, just chill, right? Um, and in the, the uh, uh, again, I, I really was excited when you were talking about the IPM website because the university just has buckets and buckets of really, really good stuff. Uh, not only for commercial growers, because they have all that too, uh, but for the home gardener. And, and don't let that intimidate you. Get really excited, get jazzed about going to the website, right? And, uh, and, and poke around on there. Um, especially on the citrus stuff, they'll have a lot of uh, uh, graphics, a lot of uh, really good photos that, that highlight things. But, but I think the thing with citrus is, is that they generally do well here. Uh, we can help them and guide them. Um, and as far as water and fertilizer, because I know we're going to talk about that because I cheated and peeked at the question sheet that you sent me. Um, and so we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about the drought too, because um, I don't know how much we've talked about that this morning, but some of the stuff you just, you know, you need to accept it. I mean, uh, there are, there are um, uh, community agriculture groups now that sell less than perfect fruit. That's still absolutely delicious, right? And nutritious. And that's what, if you're a gardener, you're going to find that whether I know I'm not a tomato a talker today or anything like that, but whether it's tomatoes or citrus uh, or anything else that you grow, it, it may not be a USDA grade number one, absolutely perfect, right? But it's still delicious and it's still nutritious and it's still yours. And so that's a really, really cool thing. Absolutely. So you mentioned the drought. We did spend a little time talking about that to start off this morning with Farmer Fred. And I, and I would like to bring that up with you so since you led into it, let's start there. Climate change is real. It is happening. We have droughts, we have fires, we have smoke, we have excessive heat. We have no you know, drought, meaning no rain. Um, what thoughts do you have with all the aspects of climate change that might be affecting the general Sacramento region as far as citrus goes? 
Well, one of the slides that I pulled up because I've been uh, allowed to, and again, uh, thank you to all the master gardeners. This is a, you know, it, it takes a family. It's the team, right? We're all part of the team here. Uh, and so there's a lot of support, but one of the things that um, I think I'm just gonna hold this up um, is, um, and I don't know if you can see this. Yes, perfect, I see it. And so, um, this is from uh, a slide from one of the presentations that I did to the master gardeners. And uh, the key thing is, I'm gonna put it down now so you can see me, is um, when you're growing uh, stuff in the garden, the backyard orchard culture, I mean, look at it, we're talking about bringing trees down uh, and I've heard uh, other folks, I won't mention Ed Livo's name, but you know, uh, you know, do you really need 18 bushels of pears? Right? Do you really need Craig Kelson in this in this article is talking about do you really need 900 oranges off your orange tree? Do you need to pump in 80 some gallons of water a day and so much fertilizer and everything? No, you don't need that. Believe me, believe me. I mean, if you get a hundred oranges off your orange tree, um, you're going to enjoy those. I mean, I'm the kind of geeky guy when I get a new tree, if I get two or three oranges, it's a super special treat, right? Uh, I'm not trying to mass produce them. And so we can use less water, less fertilizer, and that's good for your backyard. I heard uh, Greg talking about maintaining the soil. That that's good for the soil, uh, and it costs you less money uh, to do that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, decreasing the water to your citrus trees, you see, has and again for a real deep dive, they have a lot of publications for the commercial side of folks on on how they can save so many acre feet of water. Uh, by reducing it and still maintain the quality. The take home point, I think for the, the home gardener is you can cut the water down on some of your citrus trees, still get super quality fruit. In fact, the uh, quality of the fruit may increase a little bit uh, and, and still get fruit. So uh, we need to think about cutting our water down for our trees. One of the, the most common problems with citrus whether they're in containers or whether they're in the ground is overwatering. And so, and we've said that for years, but now, especially, let's take a look at our water budget for those trees. Let's see if we can cut it back a little bit. Let's experiment, cut it back a, a little bit, keep an eye on them. I heard Greg talk about, you know, uh, uh, keeping a, an eye on your garden, look and check it every day. Same kind of thing with your trees. They're your trees, right? And so, uh, uh, be a good tree parents, right? And, and check your trees, uh, but cut that water back, cut the fertilizer back a little bit, and you'll still get plenty of oranges. Uh, for those of you who want to grow 900 oranges out of a single orange tree, okay. I mean, you know, you could do that, but, um, but let's, for the rest of us, let's think about increased variety through backyard orchard culture you know, maybe uh, hedging, uh, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about in the other presentation uh, that we did, the pre-recorded one, is hedging. So you can put a couple different varieties of citrus in and have different flavors, have a blood orange, try that, try, you know, and I get excited and jazzed about all the different flavors. I'm looking forward to the day when we can have fruit tastings again, because to me, those are really, really exciting. I'm looking forward to the day when we can uh, head back out to the uh, California State Fair. We had a great presence there. And I think the other master gardeners are looking forward to that too. And we hope uh, that you appreciate that as well. Awesome. And, and thank you for bringing up Ed Livo. Last year at this time, he did a video and was one of our live Q&A. And his talk was about kind of keeping your citrus in a manageable size. So that if, you, if anybody's interested in that, that video is still up on the site so you can watch Ed Livo's video and Bill Creech's video and you'll be ready to roll with your citrus. So let's jump into some questions, Bill. Okay. Would you explain why some citrus trees bear alternately heavy and light crops and anything we should know in particular about that? Hey, that's not on the list. Well, there's, I told you there could be more questions live. Okay, Al alternate bearing is really cool. Um, some citrus trees, uh, mandarins, uh, for example, 
uh, tend to be uh, alternate bearers. So they have a big crop one year and almost nothing the following year. In fact, uh, there's a documentation of commercial mandarin growers would, would alternate their plantings and, and try and plant half their orchard one year and half the orchard the next year because they, they wanna have a supply, right, for us customers. Uh, what happens is you get a freeze and, and it sets the clock back. And all of a sudden everything is, is either alternate, you know, bearing or non-bearing. The trick in UC publications is light pruning on the trees. And there's, if you wanna uh, take a deep dive, there's, you can look at some of the, the citrus research papers, a light pruning on, on your citrus, whether it's lemons uh, or, or uh, even mandarins, they look at, at productivity production over a period of about five years, and they find that, yeah, in the, in the main years, you get a little bit less, but in the alternate years where you got almost nothing, you get a lot more. And, and so just a light pruning of the trees. When do you want to do that pruning? You can actually do that pruning just about any time, except we don't want you to prune your citrus uh, in the late fall because you'll get a quick flush of growth out of it. Same thing with fertilizing them in the late fall. Although, to further confuse things, Julie, this morning, uh, or whatever time it is when you're watching this, uh, Don Dillon, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, principals who started Four Winds Growers years ago, used to fertilize all year long because he felt that that late flush of growth was sacrificial to protect the main plant if there was a frost. Um, so there's that out there too in UC publications, but most of us, the rule of thumb is, is don't prune, don't fertilize in late fall um, and alternate bearing, you can kind of control that. All right, so you, you, you got us into the fertilizing idea. You probably noticed there's a lot of questions about fertilizing. So you just said don't in the late fall, but can you guide us through when it is best to fertilize and how to fertilize and what to fertilize with? Can we have a quick, one-on-one. Sure, sure. there's, a, there's a couple of things. There's another UC publication, which I actually printed out here uh, uh, on our, for the uh, home and garden fruits and nuts, cultural tips, right? So um, it depends on whether your citrus are in containers or whether they're in the ground. So let's talk about it in the ground. So, you know, you want to divide uh, the amount of actual nitrogen. And um, for those of you who don't know, it's NPK, right? On the uh, formula and the percentage and and Julie will go through, she's got a great graphic on, on the calculations and I'm just teasing, we don't have that. But when you come out to the garden, you can talk to us about that, right? And so um, you wanna start January, February-ish uh, with a light application of fertilizer. Uh, and then uh, probably uh, again in, in uh, April or May and then probably in July-ish or so, uh, maybe into August. I wouldn't go into September or October for the reasons that we said, but if you do, it's not fatal, right? You're going to get a flush. If we get a frost, that might burn off, right? Uh, and so um, uh, younger trees need a, a little less fertilizer. Uh, and so it's about one tablespoon of nitrogen mm -hmm. fertilizer uh, three times per year per tree for the first year. Uh, and then that increases to about a quarter of a pound. And you do those calculations. They're not hard. Right. Uh, and then uh, finally, for mature trees, you want to do about one pound of actual nitrogen, but you can use less. And so um, the calcin article that I mentioned that, that I referenced, you could probably cut the fertilizer back a little bit, give them a little shot, right? For container citrus, whether they're in a, a half barrel or a really big, uh, beautiful Italian clay pot, um, you want to think about fertilizing them with a liquid fertilizer to the soil. We're talking about soil application now. Um, uh, about twice as often as, as what it recommends. So, uh, and because it's leaching out, as you water the top, the fertilizer is migrating through and then rinsing out through the bottom. So you want to use half the concentration of your liquid fertilizer, maybe uh, twice as often. Foliar stuff is different. And, and so if you have a micronutrient issue, uh, it's okay for micronutrients. It's really, uh, and that would be your coppers and your zincs and manganese and things like that. Uh, but if you wanna apply nitrogen, foliar applications of nitrogen, 
they're, they're okay, but it's kind of a waste. It, it's better to apply that to the soil. And by foliar, we're talking on the leaves. I mean, to the leaves, a liquid spray to the leaves. Yeah. Um, what is the cause of lots of blossoms, but no fruit? Any thoughts on that? Just a very general question. Uh, I, I think sometimes it could be uneven watering or it could be a young tree uh, or it could be lack of pollination. Um, I have friends up in the Reno area and they have a beautiful house and they have a, a greenhouse, a big greenhouse with a, a mature lemon tree in it. And uh, his wife goes every spring out with a, a funky little paintbrush and hand pollinates the flowers because they're in a greenhouse and they don't have any bees or pollinators there. And they get tons of lemons that way. And um, so, um, and again, be careful when you're up on ladders and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, so it could be a lack of pollination. Uh, we talked, I heard, again, I heard Greg talking and, and I, I know that on the video, I heard uh, uh, Fred talking about, you know, we want to, uh, uh, do other plantings to bring in pollinators and good insects. And so, you know, you can do that. If you're really insistent on it, you can hand pollinate with the little teeny, even a kid's little painting brush, just kind of go out there and just tap the flowers and, and pollinate. Does, does wind help pollinate? W wind can help pollinate, but mostly for corn. I don't know that it really carries the pollen for um, uh, citrus. Um, you know, uh, I was talking about hummingbirds earlier this morning. Um, I think that they probably feed on the, the little uh, uh, critters that might be on your citrus to get some uh, protein, but I don't know that they hit the, uh, the nectaries on the, the citrus or not. That's great information, um, Bill, but for, for the person who put that question in live today, you, we might need to, to work through that a little more with you to figure out if it's watering, if it's a young tree, if it's a pollinator issue. So please don't hesitate to send in your question to the UC Master Gardener email um, on our website if you want to dig deeper into your question. Yeah, and, and, to you. and I, and I, I want to echo that as well. I mean, don't be intimidated. I mean, you know, I mean, Julie is a little scary at times. But uh, no, but no, I mean, we're all uh, the master gardeners that are phenomenal and so uh, and approachable, and we really want to help folks. Uh, and so uh, don't be intimidated or, you know, we've said this uh, before in a lot of other situations. Um, ask the question, even if it's been asked a hundred times before, uh, we want to hear it from you so we can help. Absolutely. Um, any difference between all this fertilization when you're talking about something that's directly in the ground versus something in a container? Right, and, and I apologize if I didn't highlight that. In a container, the fertilizer tends to leach out. And so uh, what I mean by that is it kind of runs through the soil and washes out the bottom, right? Where in the, in the ground, it, it stays in the immediate area and is available to the roots. And so if it washes out and, and it's flushed out through the bottom, it's not available anymore. Excuse me. So for container plants, you know, I recommend about half whatever it says on the, the label twice as often. So before we talked about fertilizing citrus in the ground, about three times a year, a container plants, you're going to use a more dilute solution uh, and maybe six times a year. You could probably even do it more, but you want to cut down the, uh, the dilution, the uh, the concentration of the fertilizer a little bit if you're going to do it more often. That's you know, great. We, we don't we don't want to contaminate our wastewater streams and everything else, and we don't we don't want to put too much fertilizer on our citrus because they'll you may have robust growth, but you may not have um, a fruit set as well as you'd like. Which goes back to you know read your packaging directions and follow, oh, absolutely. follow the the dosages and the amounts they're telling you to use to protect our environment. That's part of our goals here. Um, another fertilizer question, Bill: Will fertilizer improve sour tasting navel oranges on a thirty year old tree? Any thoughts about that? Sour tasting navel oranges on a thirty year old tree. Are you picking them while they're immature? Mm -hmm. Good question. Could be, right? It depends on when you're picking them. If you're trying to pick them for Thanksgiving, uh, they may not be, uh, uh, citrus trees live, are very long lived. Uh, there's one up in Oroville that I haven't gotten to see that's over a hundred years old. And there's uh, 
another citrus tree in Southern California that I think is close to 150 years old. Um, so they'll produce for a really long time. In fact, you can get heritage oranges at certain markets around here at certain times of the year. And those trees are probably 80, 90 years old. The fruit is sweet. It depends on when you pick it. Uh, and citrus ripen at different times. Again, you go back to UC references. Um, they have some of the more complex references will say, okay, you know, your uh, uh, navel orange uh, in Southern California ripens over this period of time. Uh, in Northern California, it ripens over this period of time. Um, go out and try one. If it's still sour, uh, wait a little while. The other thing that could happen, and, and unfortunately does happen, if you have a frost and the rootstock has taken over and you're getting fruit on your tree and the foliage looks like, oh, it changed a little bit, you know, it, it, or changed a lot. Um, you could be getting fruit from the rootstock area. In the video on the seedless kishu, you know, I kind of joked about the, uh, the, the uh, rich 16.6 rootstock. And I, I think I, my brother uh, chastised me because I used the non-technical term yucky. And so it's like, well, you know, it, it, it's yucky. I mean, if it's sour and it's, you know, it's, so you need to see where the graft line is, even on your 30 year old tree. And if it's from a sucker that's grown up and is kind of matured and is producing fruit, because they will, uh, yeah, that could be the problem. But usually if you wait later in the season, most navels I think are ripe um, and sweeter, probably mid-December and it's weather dependent and sun and temperature and all that good stuff. But uh, go out and try one, a 30 year old tree, you should have plenty of oranges to try. Uh, and so if, if they're yucky and a little, a little too sour for you, wait a little while. Adding more fertilizer is not gonna make them sweeter. Wonderful. So in your answer, you, you touched on frost and freeze. So can you define for everybody what is a hard freeze and which citrus might be more hardy or how to protect your citrus with hard freeze situations? Well, well you know, I think you're in academia, right? And so, um, you know, a hard freeze would be absolute zero. Uh, and so that's really not going to happen here in the greater Sacramento area. But we, we have had super hard freezes down to 17 degrees. And so, uh, and that, uh, that's, you know, horrible for citrus and for a lot of other stuff in the garden too. Uh, but usually we'll get frosts down around 28 degrees. Most citrus trees can handle that. The, some of the more sensitive ones, the Mexican lime, some of your lemons, uh, are, are more sensitive to that. Um, I have a Buddha's hand that I really like, and it's a really unique uh, a citrus. Uh, and that's real frost sensitive at 32 degrees. I have to start babying it by putting the Christmas lights on it that you saw in the video or the, the, uh, the cover over the top to help kind of uh, retain some of the heat to it. Um, but, you know, if it gets down around 25, and it's also time dependent. Um, so if it's... Um, uh, 25 degrees for 30 minutes during that daily cycle, uh, the trees will probably survive. Remember, you have microclimates in your yard. And so trees that are, are uh, close to the house, or if you water the ground around the tree to help retain some of the heat ahead of time, that'll increase the ambient temperature around that microclimate, maybe a degree or two, and that's probably all you need. But if it gets down into the low 20s, boy, that's when you need to be super aggressive. Um, along the line of, of the jest about citrus, you know, if it's gonna be 32 degrees and you have uh, a couple of kumquats out there and a mandarin, eh, they're probably okay. You know, you don't need to freak out about that. If it's gonna be 20 degrees, you need to freak out. Take action, <laughs> you take need, action. You need to take action and, and, and do what you can to control those trees. The other thing is, is think about when you're planning your garden, if you have that luxury, if you really, really, really want that Mexican lime or that Buddha's hand, which are frost sensitive and, and the UC references will highlight that, you need to think about maybe putting them in a container uh, so you can move them around or you need to think about where you're gonna put them in the yard so that you can run a power cord out there uh, with ground fault on it too, please. And, um, 
and put your Christmas lights and your, your uh, covering over the top to protect those. Um, we talk about slope a little bit. That, that's mostly for commercial gardeners. I mean, uh, you know, slope is good for drainage for the home gardener, but um, commercial folks, you know, they worry about the, in the foothills. And there's fabulous mandarins in the foothills. And if you haven't gone up there, I want to plug, um, you know, access to those guys. It's it's a great way to go up there. It's also a good way to talk to those folks and try them, you know, and and see, you know, the, their different uh, citrus and. And uh, I'm a big Mandarin guy. Awari Satsumas are, are incredibly delicious. But I also like the little teeny seedless Kishus that I, when I, I talk about the reference for tried and true or, or, uh, or something new, well, they're not actually new. They're, they came from Japan. They're, you know, that variety is hundreds of years old. But it, it's, it's really cool here. And especially they're, they're bigger than kumquats. They're not as big, they're not golf ball size or softball size. But they're super tasty and they're hard to find commercially because the uh, the rind is so soft, but it's so delicious. To me, it's the kind of thing, it's, well, it's like sugar snap peas. I heard Greg talking about that and, and Fred. Uh, I love those things, but they almost never make it in the house. Yeah. They, oh, and that's the way seedless quiches are. You go out in the backyard, you know, in the morning, you've got, it's, it's going to be cool season, right? So you got your, your coat on, your sweater on, and you're out in the backyard and you're peeling the thing and eating it while you're checking everything. That's the beauty of a home garden. That's what you want to get jazzed. Absolutely. At. So question about a dwarf orange tree. How many years should it take for citrus trees to really start fruiting? I have a dwarf orange tree that's four to five years old. Okay, so most citrus fruits, especially uh, dwarf uh, trees, whether they're stone fruit or whatever, they, they tend to start fruiting a little bit earlier. And for citrus, um, you can buy dwarf citrus trees that'll fruit the second year that you, you bring them home or some even the first year. So it should have some fruit on it. If it's not fruiting um, and it's struggling a little bit, I want you to think about the drainage, number one. I want you to think about how much light it's getting, number two. Uh, and, and how does the plant look? Is it kind of happy? When you go back to the video, you can kind of see the one citrus that was behind me that just kind of, I, I said it was out of tune, um, but yeah, you look at it and it's, it wasn't as happy as the Nagami kumquat. That tree was, the Nagami was super happy, right? Dark green, everything else. The other tree was kind of eh, not looking so hot, right? That's where you need to take some action and try and figure out what you could do to help the tree that's kind of out of tune, not so happy. Uh, and maybe it'll be things like reducing water, right? So you have to think, oh, I, I want everybody to realize more water isn't always the solution. Actually, that's a pun, but- <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but the, uh, but you want, you know, in the drought, again, you know, I want you to think about reducing that. Um, I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to talk about melons, but I, I found that when we grew melons in a school garden, when we cut the water down as the melons ripened, the flavor went way up on those. And I think in citrus, that happens too. So um, cut the water back and I'm rambling. So you have to bring me back into the- Okay, I'm going to bring you back in. All right. How can you tell if new growth above the graft is a water sprout? or just new growth, in particular on a navel orange tree? Okay, and so um, in the video, it may have been hard to see, but a, a water sprout is like, I don't wanna say explosive growth, cause it's not like you wake up in the morning and you hear your tree going kaboom, right? But I mean, all of a sudden, the rest of the tree is kind of this, you know, shape. And then there'll be one sprout that goes, Voop, you know, and all of a sudden in the space of a week or two, it's put on you know, 12 inches, 18 inches of growth. It the uh, stem on it tends to be triangular instead of uh, round like a, a regular uh, stem or branch uh, and or, or, or flattened. You'll notice that it's kind of flattened. Uh, and it's okay to prune those things out. Um, and how do you prune them out? With pruning shears, right? You just go in there. You're not going to snap those off. Like I talked about suckers at, down at the base below the graft. Those you want to try and snap off. And they, they just happen. I mean, it's just a growth path. Do citrus need to be thinned like stone fruits? No. Um, one of the, the, the things that happens to master gardeners is we get a ton of questions 
um, if you could weigh questions um, about June drop. And so what happens is the uh, uh, citrus tree will set a whole bunch of fruit and it'll self thin. It, it will say, hey, listen, uh, we're not producing enough energy for me to maintain these uh, 900 oranges on this tree, right? I only have enough energy to, to carry maybe 200 oranges. So the other fruit, when it's small, a little a pea size or, or maybe a little bit bigger, uh, we'll just start dropping it and it'll be graphic. I mean, you'll come out in the morning and you look on the ground and there'll be, you know, a little uh, oranges all over the place, little green uh, uh, immature fruit. Chill. <laughs> That's what happens, right? And so uh, get used to your tree doing that. Uh, do you have to thin it? Um, no. Uh, do some folks want to want to do that? They, you know, they want to man. They want to try and grow a mandarin that's this big. Oh, well, okay, if you that's your tree. If you want to do that, fine. But it's probably not going to get that big. You know, if it's a a seedless kishu, it's going to be about you know that big around. Uh, if it's a gold nugget, it'll be the size of a regular navel orange. Um, so occasionally you'll get um, uh, regular uh, navel oranges that produce a giant fruit. Uh, and that's because of the weather and, and some other things and watering patterns. Um, commercial folks don't like the giant uh, oranges because they're, uh, they're, they're outside grade. You know, they have a hard time selling them. Uh, as a backyard gardener, if you happen to get, you know, an orange that's as big as a softball, enjoy it. <laughs> it's still tasty. It's just that it, you know, it's this variation in fruit um, that that's going to happen on any tree. So we're at time, but I'm going to take a few more minutes because we're inundated with questions. So are you okay to go a few more oh, minutes? Absolutely. Okay. So this is going to be a little rapid fire. Is there a preferred time to move a young lemon tree planted in a poor location? Uh, the preferred time will be not when it's absolutely screaming hot outside. So, but if you have to do that, there are ways to do that. Um, so the preferred time would be to try and catch it in the spring, January, February-ish, when it's cooler, it has time to root. Um, you can move it just about any time, but you're going to have to be careful about it. You're going to have to watch your water. You're going to try and, and get a bigger root ball on it. Uh, you may want to use anti-transparents on the tree. Definitely paint the trunk up. Uh, I know that uh, during the drought on the commercial side, uh, some growers will actually skeletonize trees, which is a good thing that we can talk about around ha Halloween. But they, I mean, they strip all the branches off the trees, the leaves off the trees, they, they paint them, they cut them down to a couple of feet. They also do it with avocados and they'll come back the following year and, and they'll produce gangbusters, right? Um, so yeah, you can do it, but it's, it's tougher and you have to take additional steps. Go ahead. Um, Citrus Huang Longbing, yes. HLB, previously called citrus greening disease, is probably one of the most destructive diseases of citrus globally. And we have a question about how prevalent is that in Sacramento County and the surrounding areas? And should we be worried about it spreading to our home citrus trees? Oh, absolutely. We, we need to worry about that. And thank you for uh, that question. Uh, this morning, I was dismayed. I, I read the LA Times in the morning. Uh, and there's a new citru uh, HLB quarantine down in San Diego County. Now I realize that's a long ways away, right? But it's not really because there's, there's traffic and, and communication. The little critter that carries it, and, and I know that, uh, pardon me, in our presentation of the Master Gardeners, we have pictures of the nymphs and everything, and you can find them online. The, to me, the diagnostic for the general public are the little waxy tubules, right? Um, I don't know, can I say poop? Uh, it, it's like the little the little nymphs, uh, the Asian citrus psyllid, which is the little critter, the little bug that carries the disease, uh, poops out these weird little tubules. And when you look, I mean, that's really diagnostic because otherwise those critters, they have these great pictures of these uh, insects. You know, they look like they're about this big, right? They're not, man. They're like a sesame seed. They're little teeny guys, right? And so it's really hard to tell but they carry the disease. We have had uh, outbreaks of Asian citrus psyllid in the greater Sacramento area in Lincoln 
uh, a couple of years ago um, from folks who were transporting trees out of quarantine zones like Orange County. Again, I was totally dismayed to hear that there are thousands of HLB confirmed uh, citrus trees in Orange County in California. And, you know, there's traffic back and forth and it's these little teeny critters, uh, these little Asian citrusilla that carry that disease. Not all of them do, uh, but it, it, it is a real threat here and we wanna pay attention. And that's why we want to uh, buy trees locally. Uh, don't just go to take budwood off your uh, great grandma's uh, orange tree in Orange County that could be infected. You can't always tell that it's infected. It takes a couple of years for the disease to show up and then bring it up here and then uh, create a source of infection for all of Sacramento. It's a very serious issue. There are commercials and public service announcements about it. Uh, gardeners pay attention to that. Awesome. Well, Bill, we are at the end, but I would like to let you know one thing. Your years of cooking at the fair have come up in the questions and somebody wants you to share your watermelon salad recipe. So what oh. I'm going to suggest is that you go back in Judy's office, maybe or somewhere and type in an answer to that question and share your watermelon salad recipe and everybody on the call will see it if you'd like to share it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we're all about. So it's, it's uh, the, the watermelon salad thing. Uh, I think Quentin's next, right? I see, I see his uh, ugly mug down there. Hi, Quentin. And uh, he's a great guy. Pay attention to him. We'll get that watermelon salad recipe out to you. We hope to see you at the uh, Fair Oaks Horticultural Center real soon. Uh, keep those citrus questions coming and we'll be at the fair next year. I promise we'll be there and maybe we'll be cooking too. All right, take care, folks. Thanks, Bill. Great job with citrus today. Thanks. All right, everybody. Well, we have five minutes, and I'm going to let Quentin get himself comfortable. He is going to be giving a webinar. So we're switching gears a little now for the second part of the day. The second part of the day, we're going to have three of our current master gardeners, Quentin Young, Lori Ann Asmus, and Ruth Ostroff, giving you webinars, live educational sessions, and then we'll have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So my 54 attendees, here's what I need you to do. Watch, listen, ponder, think, and put questions in the Q&A box. So that at the end, when Quentin, Lorianne, and Ruth are ready to answer any of your questions about their talks, we have some questions ready to go. Um, I hope you've gotten a lot out of hearing from Farmer Fred, and from Greg Gaynor and then Bill Cresha, lots of fabulous information. Please do not forget, we also have a great website. We have an uh, UCIPM website. We have an uh, email address on that website where you can send in additional questions. Greg Gayton, I might have just said his name wrong. Somebody just said, told me that. So if I did that, I'm sorry. Greg Gayton, Fred Poffman, and Bill Cresha. Um, so we're very excited. And one thing I did want to mention, we also have an amazing garden guide and calendar. So our garden guide and calendar this year is all about fruits and it's beautiful. It takes month to month and gives you all sorts of tips and ideas. The garden guide is able to be purchased right now today at the Master Gardener website. Just find the garden guide, drop down, there'll be a button to purchase it using a credit card online. It's $10. If you purchase it online, you will get charged some postage fees to have it mailed out to you. If you'd prefer to pay with cash or check, you can show up September 11th at the Open Garden, and I believe they're going to be selling them there. But they are available online. They make great gifts, and so I'd encourage you to consider purchasing a garden guide and calendar. The proceeds of that help us run our program and our educational outreach to you, the community. So we are two minutes out from Quentin Young. Quentin, I see you. I don't think anybody else can see you yet, which is the way we do things around here, but are you thumbs up ready to start anytime? Okay, so Quentin's ready. So I'm gonna actually take a second and introduce Quentin. Quentin Young, as I said, is one of our master gardeners, but he is much more than one of our master gardeners who's been pivotal in our orchard area and other areas at the Fair Oaks Sports Center. Quentin is also the manager at the Fair Oaks Boulevard Nursery. 
another nursery in town that has often been very supportive and helpful with us. And Quentin, of course, is one of us, is always willing to help us and gives us great ideas of new things coming through the retail nurseries that we should watch for. Um, Quentin has done talks at Bear Oak Sports Center um, live Master Gardener Harvest Day events in the past. Um, so we have had that happen in the past. Um, there we go, had a little uh, accidental screen share, that's okay. So we are going to switch over to Quentin Young. Quentin, are you ready to take control of this? You are muted, so let's get you unmuted. Can't hear you, there you go. Quentin's fixing his, still don't hear you. How about now? Now you are perfect. So perfect. welcome, Quentin Young. And I'm going to hand it over to you to do your webinar for everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. I just want to confirm I have about a half hour to talk. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. So um, as uh, Julie said, thanks for the intro, Julie. Um, my talk is on unusual edibles in the Central Valley. I'm going to be primarily focusing on tropicals today. Um, basically what I'm going to try to do is introduce the plants that I have. I have quite a few, so I need to cover a lot of ground in half an hour. And then I want to sort of t discuss just really briefly where they're from um, originally, kind of air quotes originally, and then talk about their care specific to the Central Valley here in Sacramento. And just sort of reminding everybody here, our climate is Mediterranean, which generally means um wet cold winters fingers crossed we'll have a very wet winter this year um and hot dry summers so i'll be sort of addressing how a lot of these tropicals and subtropicals how they do with our hot dry summers and cold wet winters and again fingers crossed we have a good really good wet winter so the first plant that i have uh, um this is a camellia sinensis most of us are probably familiar with landscape camellias, the Camellia japonicas, the Camellia sasanquas. Um, this is an actual tea plant that you get your drinking tea from. Um, it's referred to as Camellia sinensis um, or Chinese Camellia. That's where it gets that species moniker. Um, this, uh, just like regular Camellias, it's going to need afternoon shade here in Sacramento. Um, it's a tropical or subtropical plant in originality. Um, it does really well in climates that get, let's say, 50 inches of rain a year, which we don't. But like camellias, um, they do do well here in Sacramento. But you're going to want to provide it with a couple things. Um, the first thing is acidic soil. So just like camellias need acidic soil, these um, tea plants are going to need uh, about a 6.0 to a 6.5 acidity. Um, if you're not sure of the pH of your soil, you can always get a pH meter. Um, I would recommend if you're going to grow this, maybe growing it in a pot. Um, so that way you can control the soil conditions because they're going to like regular water. Um, you're going to use good quality potting soil. And then you're going to use a fertilizer for acid loving plants. Um, apologies for one of my dogs walking around in the background. Um, so that's how the camellia is going to do. Um, it's going to like uh, most moist soil, so you're not going to let it dry out. You're not going to treat it like a succulent. Um, regular water, acidic soil. Um, if you want to acidify your soil in the pot, you could buy a um, azalea camellia potting soil. If you don't have access to that, you could use cottonseed meal as an organic um, uh, acidifier. You could also find an organic uh, plant food for acid loving plants, or you could also use soil sulfur. Any of those three things will help change the pH of the soil. I'm um, keeping in mind that in Sacramento, we have fairly alkaline soil. This variety that we sell at the nursery, it's a, what's called a Korean seedling. Um, they're sort of native to a colder region, and these will do well all the way down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you could grow this in quite a few different areas around here in Sacramento. You can see it's got um, some little flower buds. You probably won't be able to see it on the Zoom thing, but it does have a really interesting camellia type flower. It's gonna be white with some very pronounced yellow stamens, fairly fragrant. And it's a really easy plant. And if you like to grow your own tea, then you're ready to go. 
So the next plant that we're going to be talking about, this is another plant that you can drink. Um, this is going to be yerba mate. You see this being sold a lot in stores now and drinks and powders, different things like that. It's used as a source of caffeine. Um, as master gardeners and both as a nursery professional, we don't really tell you how to uh, do production of the plant. We just tell you how best to grow it. Um, so this is yerba mate. This is actually native to um, sort of South America, Uruguay, Paraguay, um, Southern Brazil. It's actually in the holly family, which you can see if you look at it fairly closely. Um, it's a fairly hardy plant like most hollies, but it is gonna like regular water. You could also grow this in a pot, um, especially if you're gonna be harvesting the leaves. Um, you could keep it smaller like a shrub. Um, in the real world, it could get up to, let's say a 20 to 30 foot tree. I don't know if you'd want it that big in your garden um, for that sort of use. It's gonna like regular water. Um, again, not, not sort of a drought tolerant plant, but growing in a pot, you'd be able to control the watering. And like um, some of the other subtropical plants, it's really not gonna like anything below about 40 degrees. So you'd wanna probably put it in a place if you've got a little microclimate that you know it's a little bit warmer, um, grow it in a pot, you can move it close to the house during the winter. Um, and again, because of our hot, dry summers in Sacramento, you'd probably want to give this a little bit of afternoon shade if you start seeing the leaves bleaching out or getting sunburned. If you start seeing a lot of brown crunchy leaves, it means you're underwatering it, which is probably gonna be the one problem you're gonna have with this in the Central Valley. So that's the um, yerba mate. And I'm gonna to try to make sure that I'm staying on time here. So here's another plant. Um, this is kind of a new plant that just showed up um, in the marketplace maybe four or five years ago. It's become really popular. I don't want to use the word trendy because it's been used a lot in different parts of the world for quite some time. Um, the American market has just sort of kind of taken this and run with it. Um, but again, it has, a, it has a long use around the world besides just here in America. And this is Moringa. So you'll see this referred to as kind of a wonder plant because it, um, you can eat a lot of different parts of the plant. Um, it does really well in um, sort of arid climates. It does well in wet climates. Um, it's fairly easy to grow. You can use it for people food. You can use it for livestock food. It has a lot of multiple uses. Um, this is actually native to um, like the Himalayan foothills in northeastern or northwestern um, India. Um, it's a very easy to grow plant. In the real world, if you plant, planted this outside and if we lived in a true tropical climate, this would turn into, let's say, a 20 or 30 foot tree. Um, the problem with this plant here in Sacramento is it's cold tolerance. It's really not gonna like anything below about 40 degrees. Um, if I'll show you here, you can kind of see it has these very kind of green soft stems um, similar to let's say parsley or cilantro, these are really susceptible to cold. Um, if you were to put this outside in the winter right now at this size, most of these stems would just melt at about 40 degrees. There are some, <clears throat> excuse me, Moringa uh, orchards over in Fresno. Um, when these get quite large as a tree, I'm gonna say with the trunk, maybe about this diameter, they're much more cold hardy, but you're going to want to really protect this one for the first couple of years until it starts to develop a woody trunk. You can see a little bit of the color change on this thicker one. Um, you could grow this in a pot. It's going to like regular water. Um, these also develop in time if it's a large tree and you'll sometimes see these um, pods in certain uh, grocery stores around Sacramento. I bought them before. It's often referred to as a drumstick tree. It forms a, a plant that's or I'm sorry, a pod that's referred to a, as a drumstick, and that's also edible. Um, and again, this is the moringa. Um, nothing below about 40 degrees, um, but it does really well in our climate. You're just going to want to protect it in the winter. How am I doing on time? Okay, so let's see. So that's the, we've done the tea, we've done the yerba mate, we've done the moringa, and now we're going to move over to our bananas. So I have two bananas with me, and I'm going to sort of move over this way. Hopefully you'll be able to see me between the bananas here. 
Um, I brought two different kinds of bananas with me here to talk about. Um, there's over a thousand different varieties of bananas that are in commercial cultivation. And there's something like, um, I'm sorry, there's about 10 to 20 um, commercial varieties in cultivation, but there's over like a thousand varieties of bananas that are used, um, they're edible and then used and grown around the world. Um, we're gonna be talking about these two types here, which are referred to as raw or fresh eating bananas. And that's to differentiate them between, let's say, the cooking bananas like plantains. So I have two kinds right here. This is the um, dwarf Cavendish banana. This is the most popular one in, let's say, the Western or American markets. This is the one you typically get in the grocery store. It was named uh, around the 1800s. Um, it's been around for quite a bit longer than that. Um, don't let the name fool you. The dwarf Cavendish part uh, refers to the fruit, not the size of the tree. So if you planted this outside, you're gonna get a good 15 to 20 foot tree. The dwarf part refers to the fruit that are usually picked around three to six inches. Um, bananas in general do well here in Sacramento, but they're gonna have a couple problems. Um, one is our hot, dry summers. So you're gonna to wanna to try to plant this somewhere where it's gonna get maybe a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, if you have a little microclimate or protected area in your garden. Um, the other one is our very windy weather. Um, so you'll see here on some of these leaves that they're torn. Um, that's fairly common for bananas. That's their defense mechanism um, to, be, uh, to prevent themselves from being thrown down on the ground if these leaves didn't tear. You can see a tear here. It doesn't take much to tear them. It doesn't seem to affect the health of the plant. But if you plant this somewhere, you might want to think about staking it because you know we always have those random 40 to 45 mile an hour windy days. The um, bananas in general are native to Southeast Asia. So that you have, again, that high humidity, subtropical climate, but you can grow them here. Generally, generally they do well to around 28 degrees, depending on where you live in the area. Um, we're lucky here in the Central Valley that our ground doesn't freeze. So if we were to have a very bad winter, um, you might lose the plant to the ground, but it would re-sprout when the ground warms up, but usually not till maybe March or April. Um, so give it some time. They're heavy, heavy feeders. So you do wanna have them on a regular fertilizing basis, whether you use conventional fertilizers or organic fertilizers, that's your choice. Um, but just check to see what the numbers are on there. Um, I would probably uh, recommend not using too much of a commercial fertilizer because they don't like accumulation of, of salts. Um, so you, when you plant them, you're gonna wanna make sure that their soil drains really well. Again, the problem that we have in the Sacramento Valley is our heavy clay soil. Um, so you'd wanna amend the soil really well, make sure it's loose and well draining um, and get on a regular fertilizing schedule. Um, and regular water. Um, so again, that's the dwarf Cavendish banana. Behind it, I have a different one here, and this is the Mekong giant. Um, and as its name implies, this is um, native to the Mekong uh, plateau all the way up to Tibet. Um, really fast growing. You can see the difference in size between the two bananas. Um, unlike the dwarf Cavendish, the Mekong giant actually gives you a purple banana. And if you've never tried different banana types, um, I recommend that you do. Um, go to maybe it's a farmer's market or uh, an unusual grocery store that maybe is in your neighborhood. There's so many different kinds of bananas and they have some really unique tastes and colors. Um, the Mekong Giant, if you, let's say, if we lived in an area with heavy rainfall, high humidity, these can get up to 30 or 40 feet um, with a trunk of a diameter about this big. Um, I doubt if you get that here because we have a shorter growing season, our climate tends to be drier, um, but you can see it is putting off a pup, which is how they reproduce. Um, and then, like I said in the past, if we were to have a really bad winter, a hard freeze, which we haven't had in, I'd say, at least five or six years, you might lose a, a, a top of the banana, but it would re-sprout at the base. Um, we're growing actually at the Fair Oaks Horticulture Center, um, a dwarf Cavendish banana in a barrel. We have a number of different tropical fruit trees um, at the Hort Center in barrels. Um, and you'll see if you can hopefully come to our next open garden day, which might be in September. I think that's still being decided, but you'd be able to see the tropicals that we have in the barrels. And at the Hort Center, we have 
a newly built what we call tropical hut. And it serves two purposes. It gives some protection to some tropicals in the summer. Um, so a good example, um, we'll sort of look at some of the other ones, might give them a little bit of shade protection with our hot, dry summers. And then it also gives a little bit of winter protection um, for some of our tropical plants to give them a little bit of protection for our cold weather. Um, the banana, actually, we've been keeping out. We've decided we're going to keep it out year round because even though it does get beaten up and die to the ground in the winter, like I said, our ground doesn't freeze and it comes right back. So we're using that as an example of not having to protect it too much. And that's how most of these bananas are going to work. So speaking of plants that we have at the Hort Center, um, and then this is probably the probably the number one most popular tropical, subtropical plant that we get asked a lot about both at the nursery and at the horticulture center. And we do have a demo of one of these at the horticulture center, and that's an avocado. So there's basically three groupings of avocados in Sacramento. And you're looking at um, Mexican, Guatemalan, and West India. Those are your three kind of main classes of avocados. Um, the Mexican avocados tend to be the hardiest for the Sacramento area because they've been hybridized and developed on the Mexican um, Northern plateaus. So they do well, better with our hot, dry summers. Um, the Guatemalan and West Indian um, tend to like a little bit more humidity and a little bit more rain. And they're very, very unhappy with our um, cold, wet winters. However, don't let that dissuade you from trying. Um, we've got lots of different varieties at the nursery. Um, this is a Stewart avocado. This is referred to as a, this is a Mexican type avocado. Um, at the horticulture center, we have a little cotto. Um, that's a dwarf. I think it's most likely um, a Guatemalan variety. And that will show you um, the, the little cottos is a dwarf that you could grow in a barrel. It would be e really easy to control. Um, its size and to protect it in the winter. So we have one of those at the Hort Center. We do need to protect it in the summer, like most avocados from our hot, dry weather. You'll start getting some sun scald when we start having these 105 degree days. Um, some of the avocados, you can see it here, they're not happy with our, with our weather in the summer. And then they're also um, unhappy with our winters because they don't like to be cold and wet for extended periods of time. Um, so if you're going to plant them in the ground, you're going to have to sort of search in your garden for that special sweet spot. You're going to need really good drainage. So we recommend you amend the soil, something with like a cactus succulent mix. You want to mix in some really good pumice. You want to mound it well. They don't, they'll get really bad root rot if they sit in our heavy clay soil over the winter. Um, so again, amend your soil really well plant um, in a really well-drained hole or in a container. Um, the little cotto is one dwarf that'll do well in the container. We also have another semi-dwarf variety at the nursery called Holiday. Um, but check your local nurseries, um, see what you can find. Um, feel free to experiment. Like I said, there's different kinds of avocados. Um, see what does best for you in your climate, your little microclimate in your garden. I know a lot of people like to grow avocados from pits. Um, it's a really great idea, but the, um, the, the plant that you'll get from that pit um, varies widely. You really have no control over how that flower has been pollinated. The question we get a lot about with avocados is the type A or type B. So just really quickly, all avocados are self-fruiting, but um, some people will feel that you'll get more, um, more production if you have a type A or a type B. Um, I don't have time to go into all the detail of the different kinds um, of A's or B's. The main difference has to do with when the flowers open and avocados are considered to have perfect flowers, um, meaning both male and female parts, but the A and B refers to um, when the flowers open at what time of day and when they're receptive to pollen. Um, so you can always check that. At the nursery, we have everything labeled by A or B, so it's pretty easy for you to find. Um, some people, um, especially in Sacramento, will paint the branches in the same way that you paint fruit trees um, to prevent sunburn. Um, again, if you're going to do that, you're going to use a 50-50 uh, paint water combination, uh, interior latex and water. Um, usually most people will use white. That's the most common one. 
but they do, um, they will paint the branches, especially the areas that face the sun because the avocados do get really bad um, sunburn. And then in terms, just like with the bananas, in terms of fertilizing, I'd recommend using an organic fertilizer because avocados do not like um, chemical salts. Um, if you plant one in the ground, in the ground in a mound, let's say you might want to get in the habit of flushing them out. Or again, hopefully we have a nice wet winter, but you want to be really careful about using commercial fertilizers because you don't want to burn the roots. So I only got 10 minutes left. So we're going to go to the next one. And this is a mango. Um, mangoes, again, really popular in, in Sacramento, very cold sensitive. So this is probably going to be one of the trickier plants to grow. Um, there's basically two classifications of mangoes, Indian or Philippine. Filipino mango or Philippine mangoes. Um, this one is a Manila, so this is a Philippine mango. You'll see these in the store, kind of small, bright, goldish yellow, very sweet. Um, if you were, let's say, to live in Hawaii or a true tropical climate, this would turn into a 40, 50 foot tree. I doubt if you would get it that big here. Um, they're native to uh, Northern India, uh, up into Burma, Bangladesh. Um, there's probably seven, several hundred different cultivars. Um, the problem is, is they're going to be hardy only to about 40 degrees. Um, so if you do have a mango, you are going to want to protect it. Um, a couple of years ago, we had the Kiet mango at um, the nursery, and they actually did produce um, large each. We had two, actually a couple of different plants, but two that we had remaining at the end of the season both produced um, large mangoes. So they are productive here. Um, just like everything else, um, you're going to want to make sure it has really well-drained soil. Um, unlike the other things that we've talked about, they don't mind really alkaline soil. So our soil is actually here pretty good for them. The, the problem is it's going to be temperature. And then again, just like with the other plants, they're not going to like a heavy accumulation of chemical salts in the soil. Um, all mangoes are self-fruiting, so you don't have to worry about having two different varieties. Uh, excuse me. And you want to get, get these, just like the bananas, they're um, fairly heavy feeders. So you're going to want to get them on a feeding schedule, usually at least three times a year. And so that's mangoes. Now this one right here, this is a sapote. Uh, this is another easy tropical one to grow. You can actually grow this one. This doesn't mind too much um, with our cold temperatures. This one will do all, um, all the way up to, let's say, Dixon. Um, 28 to 30 degrees for our winter temperatures. Um, fairly easy. Um, they're going to need, like most everything else here, with the things that I've shown you, these tropical plants, some wind protection. Um, they're actually okay with cold, wet roots. Um, but it's got to be well drained. So again, if, we, if you have an area that's got a heavy clay soil, make sure you amend it really well. Again, we recommend succulent mix because it drains well. Um, mix in some pumice. Um, I wouldn't recommend perlite or vermiculite unless it was in a pot. Those, um, those two products are great for pots. I find that they don't hold up really well uh, in the soil. They break down really fairly rapidly. Um, but pumice does work really well and it holds up for a much longer period and it doesn't change the pH of the soil. Um, if you're going to feed this one, I would use a well-balanced um, organic fertilizer, citrus fertilizer. And again, um, like most of the other ones that we've shown before, they don't like uh, chemical salts. And this is another one, the sapote, um, excuse me, <coughs> the sapote. And then when we talk about this one, the cherimoya, these are two tropical fruits that don't travel very well. They don't ship well, they don't hold up well. So um, if you've had the opportunity to try one fresh, do so. Um, these are native to central Mexico, although they're grown all through um, Latin America. Um, so if you can find one, try it. Um, don't be disappointed. Let's say if you tried one here and it wasn't very good, it may have just been picked too early. So that's the sapote. Next to that, I'm going to move this guy out of the way. Over here, we have a cherimoya. This is referred to as a custard apple. Um, this apparently was uh, Mark Twain's uh, favorite fruit. Um, it's a, 
we have one of these at the Hort Center. Um, we actually have a um, Adamoya, which is a Cherimoya cross, but it has this really distinctive sort of droopy leaf that looks almost felty. Um, this is another one that we had been growing in the tropical hut. And then we ended up taking it out because the nursery, I don't protect these at all, either in the winter or the summer. But you can see here, um, they will be a little bit unhappy. This is when we had those 107 degree days, I think it was 111, um, maybe two weeks ago. Um, they're really unhappy with that. And that's the problem that you're gonna have with a lot of these subtropicals is our hot, dry summers. Um, you can see here, they just sometimes dry out faster than you can replenish the water. Um, these are native to Central and South America. Um, they can go all the way up to something like 8,500 feet in terms of um, elevation. They're hardy in the maybe the 25 to 30 degree range. Um, the problem that we have here is that because they're uh, do so well in a higher elevation, they're sometimes unhappy with our are really, really hot summers. They have a really interesting, distinct flower. Um, we've had ours at the Hort Center flower a number of times. The problem that we have growing them here is finding a natural pollinator for them. So if you do have um, one of these, or if you decide to grow one, you're gonna wanna hand pollinate it with a little, little paintbrush. Um, but the flowers are very unique and they're incredibly fragrant. You almost don't notice them at first. Um, and again, like most of these other tropicals, if you're gonna put it in the ground, um, make sure it drains very well because you want it, they're really susceptible to root rot. And then, like I said, um, we have one of these at the horticulture center, you can come see ours and we have ours in a wine drum. So I have about five minutes left. And so we're gonna to go to this guy. Um, I brought actually three different ones, but I ran out of room on my table. So I only have one here. Um, these are the tropical guavas. Um, we sell a number of different types at the nursery. Um, we have a Brazilian pink guava. I have one of those outside that I brought. Like I said, I ran out of room. Um, we have a Brazilian pink guava at the nursery. We have a Mexican white or Mexican cream. And then this is the red Malaysian guava. These are the groupings that are referred to as the tropical guavas. You can see I brought this one because it actually has some guavas on it. Um, they're fairly easy to grow. We have um, the Brazilian pink guava growing at the Horticulture Center in a barrel. It has produced fruit. Um, they're native to Central America, South America, through the Caribbean. Um, you might, depending on where you grow these, give them a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, at the nursery, we just have them out in the full sun and they do fine. At the horticulture center, we have it out in the full sun and it does fine. Um, we don't protect it in the winter anymore. They're hardy down to about 28 or 30. Um, they'll drop their leaves. They usually won't leave out until later in the year. And they tend to produce their fruit fairly late. So we'll sometimes find fruit on the trees, sometimes even as late as October, November. Um, when they've dropped the leaves and then suddenly you find the fruit. Um, they like regular water, they like well-drained soil, and they do like regular feedings, and they are considered um, self-fruiting. There's other guavas that we have at the nursery as well. We have um, strawberry guavas and lemon guavas. Um, there's a plant that many, many people are familiar with uh, in Sacramento called the pineapple guava, which isn't a true guava, but you'll see we'll have it next to this at the nursery. We also have a pineapple guava growing in, in the well garden um, at the horticulture center. And so those guavas, they do really well. They're very easy to grow. And like I said, there's different colors, um, red, pink, and white. Um, I've got about two minutes left. So I'm just gonna jump over here to the corner and we're gonna talk about um, passion fruit vine. Um, really easy to grow. You can see how big it is, how vigor it is, vigorous it is. These to me are very easy to grow in Sacramento, native to like Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, but they're all over, basically all over the world now. Um, and some places they're considered invasive. Um, I haven't heard that here in California. Um, they are self-fruiting. You can see the flower here. This one hasn't opened, and this one up here opened and finished. This guy literally just opened a couple minutes ago. Really beautiful flower. In Sacramento, a lot of the pollination is done by carpenter bees. Um, they're like the B-52 of pollinators. They're incredible. Um, this is, as you can see, it's quite vigorous. 
So give this at least um, 10 to 20 feet in terms of coverage, grow it on a fence, that sort of thing. Um, the preferred range is in the 60 to 80 degree temperature, um, but they do do well um, in our climate here. Um, in terms of cold hardiness um, in the maybe the 28 to 30 range, but our ground rarely freezes here. So even if you lost a lot of this over the winter, it will just re-sprout and grow again when it warms up. Regular feeding, regular water on this one. Next to it, I have another passion fruit vine. This is called a maypop. This is actually native to the east coast of the US, um, has been used for a long time by Native Americans and then uh, Westerners when they encountered it as well. Um, I actually got to taste the fruit of one of these the other day and it tastes a lot like a tropical passion fruit. Um, you can see the leaves are smaller, a little bit more delicate um, than these leathery um, uh, Passiflora edulis. This is Passiflora um, incarnata. This is also a great host vine for the Gulf fritillary caterpillar or butterfly. And that's also called a maypop butterfly. So if you like butterflies, this will attract them. They're not interested in these heavy leaves. They don't seem to have any um, interest in this thick leaf, but they will show up if you grow this vine. The only caveat to this one is this does sucker. So if you plant this, um, expect to find this vine maybe 10, 15 feet away. It'll send a sucker underground and pop up in the middle of nowhere. Um, this can die to the ground in the winter and comes right back, it doesn't care. Um, and I think I am now officially out of time. Um, so I think now it's time for questions. Julie, Quentin, you... Quentin Young, you're amazing. <laughs> you. Rapid fire, um, unusual edibles in the garden. As always, when Quentin comes with all his forest of plants, it's really exciting to see all these new things. And Quentin, take a breath. We have a lot of questions, you ready? Yeah. All right. Um, some of them should be pretty quick, so hopefully we can get through them. Um, and for everybody listening, remember you can throw questions in the Q&A box and we will address as many as possible. What soil mix do you recommend for dragon trees? Oh, for like a dragon fruit, you could, you're gonna wanna definitely use succulent mix because basically it's a succulent. All right. Cactus succulent mix. And you, you should be able to buy it pre-bagged. There's lots of recipes online if you wanna mix your own, but you can just go get a pre-bagged succulent mix and you should be fine. Perfect. And how does papaya do regionally? So papayas would do okay. Um, we, tr we tried them at the horticulture center. Um, this was before we started experimenting with a lot of tropicals. They don't like being cold and wet. Um, they actually turn to mush. We didn't protect them from the rain. So if you're gonna do a papaya, grow it in an area where you can really control um, the, the soil around the roots, maybe in a large pot or a container. I do want to try to grow them again this year, and that's definitely a plant that we're going to grow in the tropical hut so that we can keep it cold and dry over the winter. Fabulous. And any insight in where somebody might find a Duke avocado tree? No, that's one of the ones that I just haven't been able to find. So I don't know if you could find one online and just make sure that they're um, legally allowed to ship to this area. But I have not been able to find one of those from any of my growers. All right. Um, the banana tree at the Hort Center, has it produced fruit? It has not yet, no. And I think what we've tried, what we're going to do this year that we haven't done in the past is I've been really consistently feeding them in the barrels every month, which we haven't in the past. And I think that was that has been a mistake. In general, at the Hort Center, we don't feed trees a lot because we don't want a lot of new vegetative growth that we then have to have to uh, water in the terms of being in the middle of a drought. But in the container, just like my container citrus, container citrus that I grow at home, I feed them every month and they're much more productive. So just about two or three months ago, we started getting on a regular monthly feeding schedule. So I think we'll hopefully see a difference in production this year or maybe not till next year. That's great. I think when we get our first bananas, we need a picture front and center on the web page. Definitely. Yeah. Um, should one regularly miss the subtropicals or tropicals to try to reproduce a natural humid requirement, or do they just require a hut for moisture as well as cold? I think either one would work. If you had a greenhouse that you could control the humidity, that would be great. But if you just want to really quickly wash them down, that would be fine too. It doesn't take a lot of water. 
just wash them down really quickly. Same thing goes with gardenias. They actually like a little bit of um, humidity. So whenever you're watering your plants, just wash them down really quickly. Perfect. Um, what is the best variety of avocados to grow in particular in the Elk Grove area? Um, understand Haas does not grow well here. Uh, well, I think you're going to, again, you're going to want to look for something that's referred to as a Mexican, uh, a Mexican avocado. So like Mexicola, Mexicola Grande, Stewart, um, they tend to do better with our hot, dry climates. So that doesn't mean you can't experiment. Very good. And I have a fig tree question. Okay. Does, does a mission or brown turkey fig need a pollinator in order to set fruit? And this person is asking because they're not seeing much fruit setting when they visit the tree at the Hort Center, um, as they see on the tree at the Hort Center when visiting in past harvest days. So um, they are all considered self-fruiting and the fig tree at the Hort Center tends to produce late. And we actually just had our first harvest of figs um, last week. Awesome. Um, yeah, Black Mission, White Flanders, I'm drawing a blank on the third one. They're three in a hole, but they, they have just started producing and they're actually covered with figs this year. Great, all right. Hopefully that helps our big question. Um, another question that was asked earlier and Judy gave a quick response, but she said you might have some more ideas. Why is it recommended to prune apricots and cherries during the summer rather than during dormant months like other stone fruits? Well, so at the Hort Center, basically all stone fruits, we recommend not pruning in the winter. Um, so we do what's called delayed winter pruning, which is usually not till March or April when we're pretty confident it's not gonna rain anymore. Um, so with most, especially cherries and apricots, if you prune them um, too late in the fall, the wounds take too long to heal, then the rains come and then they get really susceptible to a lot of bacterial and fungal infections through those still open wounds, those pruning wounds. So we do um, very little winter pruning at the Hort Center. We do um, delayed winter pruning first, and then we do summer pruning for the rest of the summer. Basically to keep the fruit trees smaller for harvest, to be able to open them up and get sun down to uh, lower fruiting branches and also to pre prevent disease. Great. Um, and, and I have a quick question and you might've just said it, but just in case, how many varieties are on the fig tree at the Hort Center? I think three. I think um, Black Mission, White Kadoda, and I think maybe the other one is Brown Turkey, but I'm drawing a blank on that third one. Okay. Or white three. And it's a three in a hole. So it's basically three figs that are planted together, and then we prune the center branches so that the, the, the tree grows as a circle, but basically like... Uh, in thirds like a pot, which is very easy to do. We have a number of uh, examples of that at the Hort Center, of a three in a hole or a four in a hole, where you can plant um, four trees in the space of one tree to get more productivity. And I've got a comment that that makes a fun playhouse for kids. It does actually, it has a, we call it our secret clubhouse because it actually has a little room in the center that you can just sort of hang out there on really hot days and do pruning. That's fantastic. Um, do you have a recommendation for the height of persimmons? This person would love to keep it under 12 feet if possible. Uh, that's totally doable. We just did our first pruning on the persimmons at the Hort Center. Um, so very easy to keep it lower. Um, again, hopefully if we have an open garden day soon, you'll be able to come and see how we have the persimmons pruned, but you could definitely keep them at 12 feet. We, like I said, we just did our first pruning. We were a little bit cautious because we didn't want to expose too much to sunburn this time of year, but this is about the time of year that the persimmons start sending out these tall upright branches and we do keep them pruned back. And do cherries grow well using the three and whole system? And if so, what other fruits can be grown by this method? So what can you do the three and whole? Cherries can be. Um, we have a multigraph cherry, which is different, but cherries would do well. And really anything would work well. Um, the most uh, plums and pluots would probably be the most uh, vigorous growers. It would maybe take the most work to keep contained. 
but you could do it with pretty much any sort of tree. We at the Hort Center, we have it done with peaches, with nectarines, we've done it with pluots. Um, so you can pretty much do it with anything. Got it. And um, Judy's just sending me a quick message to let people know that the persimmons and pomegranate are not in the orchard proper. They're a little outside the orchard area. So if you're ever running around Fair Oaks Hort Center and you're looking for those in the orchard, you have to go out in the rest of the yeah. Hort area. Oh, there's a top of the hill. We have some espaliered Asian pears. We have a peach and cherry fan. Behind that, we have a miniature um, dwarf apple. And then to the left of that, we have two persimmons and two pomegranates. And then you're gonna be walking into the vineyard at that point. Yeah, so um, Quentin's mentioned it a couple times, but Open Garden at the Hort Center is right now scheduled for September 11th, Saturday, September 11th from nine to 11. So we hope as Quentin's mentioned, you can come out walk around the orchard and the other areas to see some of these trees and plants that he and others have been talking about all morning. And um, Quentin, you did it. We got through all those questions with a minute to spare. So do you have any closing statement or ideas or encouragement? Yeah, I, I would say if you're looking for these trees, you know, obviously we sell them at the nursery, but just check your local nursery, depending on where you live, go in, ask if they don't have it, see if they can get it. Um, you know, whether it's whether you live near an independent nursery or a big box store, go in and see what they have. Um, don't be uh, afraid as a gardener to, an ex to experiment. Um, I do a lot of almost all my gardening in containers, so don't feel that you have to put things in the ground. Um, and part of just the fun of it is trying something new. So don't be discouraged or um, don't be apprehensive about just trying something different. And any, any unique veggies at the, at the nursery right now? Well, we're sort of in between seasons. So we'll be getting all of our new fall stuff probably in September. Okay. Uh, so we had a lot of things like um, bitter melon and cucamelon. We had a lot of unusual summer stuff. We had some really unusual melons and pumpkins, um, but we've sort of so grown or uh, sold through those. And we're sort of in a holding period waiting for all of our fall and winter stuff to come in. So check back like in September and October, and that'll be the great time to take out your summer garden and start putting in all your fall stuff. Well, Quentin Young, as always, uh, you're a treasure to our program and to the community, and we're thrilled to have you speak at Harvest Day again. And now you can add virtual format to your resume of speaking engagements. And thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. Bye, Quentin. Bye. So everyone, we are to poll question number two. Um, we have one question in the second poll. I have just launched it. We're asking you about growing edible crops and which of the following issues cause you the most trouble. And you have to pick one. So if you have a whole bunch of issues, pick the one that's the worst. Um, selecting the proper varieties, attracting pollinators, aphids or other insects, or determining how to water your plants. So we have four options. Poll again, these polls are to help us help Judy figure out how we're going to work our educational materials and, and educational offerings in the cover coming year. What, what our um, attendees might be needing more help on with their garden. I also wanted to let you all know that it has been reported to me that you see websites kind of going up and down and up and down. So if you tried to take advantage of some of these site links we've been sharing with you, the Master Gardener site, the IPM site, and you found that they are a little wonky this morning, maybe down, please have some patience. I think UC is having some um, technical issues and they're working on it and they, they will be back up. So, you know, bookmark them and go visit them at a later time if you have continued trouble this morning. Um, but don't forget to go back and visit them. They're really great websites. So I've got 34 people who've taken the poll. We got 53 people here today. Come on, take that poll, take that poll. Um, we need that for um, knowing where to send you. And I'd also like to mention one more time that Quentin is coming to us from not only being one of us, the Master Gardener, but he is the manager at Fair Oaks Boulevard Nursery. Um, and, and they have supported us numerous times over the years. So we'd like to let you know about that. And then one more time, we have to acknowledge our amazing sponsors. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna to listen to the SMUD video again, because SMUD is one of our major sponsors for our events. In 2030, in just nine years, I'll be 18. 
Off to college? Probably getting my own place. I want to live where the air is fresh. Where they take care of the planet. I want to live in the best city. The cleanest city. I want to live in a clean power city. By 2030, SMUD will be 100% carbon free, so you can live in a clean power city. Join the charge at cleanpowercity.org. And again, many thanks to SMUD for being one of our sponsors for Harvest Day this year. It's been a pleasure as always working with them. And I also wanted to share, let me see if I can get this going for you. The, our sponsor list one more time with you. So you can see again, here we have community partners, Harvest Gold sponsors, Green Thumb, Blooming Business, and web sponsors. And without all their support, um, we would not be able to have the Harvest Day that we had this year. And for all our sponsors in past years, we rely on sponsors to help us make this large event possible. And it is still a large event, even though it's virtual, it takes a lot of time to make this happen, even virtually, and a lot of resources. So we appreciate all our sponsors, SMUD, as, as we showed the videos, and Green Acres, having Greg here was phenomenal, and everyone else, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you've done to support the Master Gardener Program. And I hope those of you attending will take note of these sponsors that are also listed on our website, and maybe um, show them some of your love by visiting them or sending them notes. We are going to dive into houseplants shortly, but before we do that, we do have a poll open. I've got 38 people who've taken the poll. So I'm gonna close that down pretty soon. So please do poll number two, when growing edible crops, which issues cause you the most trouble? We wanna know what you're thinking. Um, and then also, uh, to share my screen one more time, we have Sacramento County and the city of Sacramento. They host household hazardous waste and electronic waste times. There's locations in the north, in the southeast, in the um, central area, the south area, where you can take waste paint containers, oils, batteries, pesticides, which of course we're concerned about that require special care. It's illegal to dump those wastes. So we really encourage you to use the proper waste removal and hazardous waste dumping locations. And I see Judy's popped in. Judy, were you wanting to say something about hazardous waste disposal? Well, Julia, we're having a good time this morning sharing education with the public and Disposal of household hazardous waste is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. It's kind of a passion of mine. Many years ago, the Master Gardeners did a project of educating the public on how to keep pesticides out of our creeks and out of our rivers. And it became very clear to me how important it is to make sure we dispose of our pesticides properly. And right now, the real estate market in Sacramento is just going crazy. People are moving right and left and they're anxious, they're stressed out, and then they're in a hurry to get that moving truck loaded and get on. And sometimes they don't have the patience to properly dispose of their pesticides. So I just ask our audience to help us work together to educate your neighbors. And if you need to help your neighbors properly dispose of those pesticides, please go over there with a big box, collect uh, chemicals and paint that are properly labeled, hopefully in the original containers and sealed properly, and then take them to one of the sites that are here in Sacramento. And they're all free. You do not have to pay to get to dispose of hazardous waste. And if we don't do it properly, it's going to end up in our creeks. And we have a lot of little creeks throughout Sacramento and end up in the American River. And my guess is many of you have been out on the American River rafting at some point in your life, <laughs> especially during our hot summer. So we want to keep that water clean. So let's all work together and make sure paint, oil, batteries, including the batteries on our power tools that we use when we work in the garden, and any fertilizer or pesticides get disposed of properly. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Judy McClure. For those of you who don't know, Judy is our Master Gardener Coordinator, and she's been behind the scenes all morning, keeping things running smoothly, and glad she jumped in so we can see your face. 
Okay, so let's look at our poll. I'm going to stop the poll now and share the results. So 26% of you say selecting the proper varieties for growing location is your problem. 8% pollinator attraction, 32% aphids and other insects, and 34% water, 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 how to water, when to water, how much to water, everything with water. So that's, that's great. That gives us some, some information to work on and some thoughts. And we did have somebody um, throw in Q&A that their biggest problem is selecting plants is making them work in our heavy clay soil. And that wasn't an option. So yeah, clay soil is always um, troubling for many people. Um, and that is warranted also. So Lori Ann, can you unmute? And let's make sure we hear you okay. Don't know if I, yeah, do you have, can you see on there, Lori, to unmute yourself? I think you can hear me now. Oh, you're perfect, Lori. <laughs> all right, so let me introduce Lori. I had a little help. <laughs> we all are getting butt through this morning with a lot of little help, so. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So Lorianne Asmus is a master gardener, also a longtime master gardener. She's also an award-winning interior landscaper um, or plantscaper. Um, and she's a UCD bachelor's in environmental planning. And she's been a frequent guest on Get Growing with Farmer Fred. So we heard from Farmer Fred earlier this morning, his radio show. She's the owner of Emerald City Interior Landscape Services. And she is here to talk to you about tips for house plant selection and care. Lori Ann is gonna to talk to us for about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna turn it over to her, but those of you in attendance, again, listen, think, ponder, and throw mm -hmm. questions in the Q&A. So at the end, we can ask Lori Ann a few of your favorite house plant questions. Lori Ann, you ready? Yeah. yeah. It's all yours. More than ready. Okay, thanks a lot, Julie. I really appreciate it. Um, as Julie just said, uh, my name is Lori Ann. And I am a longtime master gardener and um, houseplant specialist. And I'm super excited to be here today to talk to you about houseplants and um, help you to be successful with them because I know it's really popular these days. It's, it's, it's really a big thing. And there's just an awful lot of questions out there. Um, I know a lot of people go to the internet for information and um, sometimes uh, the information is not as helpful as it could be. And so hopefully I can give you some tips in order to navigate that a little bit too. Um, I'm going to start with selection. Um, I have several topics that I'm going to cover, but I'm going to start with selection because I think that it's really important. And of course, that's the beginning of it. We do uh, have impulse buys, of course, but um, it's much better if you're buying houseplants, if you can do just a little bit of prior planning. So think about where you want the plant, what you want the plant to do, what the environment is like, how much light you're gonna get, you know, um, whether it's near a, a window or maybe where it's near a vent or a fireplace or something like that, what you actually want the plant to do. And it's also really important to think about um, what your lifestyle is and what your uh, ability to take care of the plants is as well. Some plants require an awful lot more care than others. There's some that are really bulletproof and I'm gonna show you some later that you know pretty much almost anyone can grow. Um, but sometimes people want something a little more challenging or they want something a little bit different. But if you're someone who travels a lot or something like that, you're not gonna be around every week to water. There's certain things that you probably don't wanna buy. So think about what your um, habits are and what your lifestyle is before you make a choice on plants. Now, the second thing about selection that I think is really important is that you pick a reputable um, place to go to buy your plants. And there are many places where you can buy plants. Um, and I think a lot of it really is establishing a relationship with a location or with a certain buyer. Some places uh, are surprisingly um, reliable in a way that you might not expect, but you really need to pick a place that feels comfortable to you, whether it's a local nursery. I mean, obviously if it's something in your neighborhood, it's gonna be a lot easier to go back and ask questions, but you wanna pick some place that you feel comfortable to be uh, to buy your plants. Um, it's pretty important when you're picking out indoor plants that they are indoors, 
when you buy them. So like you don't want to uh, go and look for your indoor plants if they've stored them outside or if they're out on a pallet someplace outside. That's not going to be a very good uh, start. A lot of times um, people will buy a plant and they'll take it home and they won't do well with it and they'll blame themselves. Uh, nine times out of 10, people will blame themselves for a failure with houseplants. When in reality, a lot of times it's just that selection process that hasn't gone well and you haven't picked the right plant for the right spot. And sometimes you're behind the eight ball before you ever get started because the plant maybe isn't healthy to begin with. So once you pick a location for your plant and your purpose and all of that stuff that we talked about, and you pick a place where you're gonna go buy your plant, then when you find the plant that you want, and, and like I say, I understand that there's impulse buys and it's kind of like what Quentin was talking about earlier, you know, there's gonna be times when you experiment with something and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're looking for a specific thing, what you wanna do is you wanna go and you wanna look for that specific thing. And then you wanna really look at not just the plant and whether it's a beautiful plant, but whether or not the soil is good, whether you're seeing uh, any sort of insect problems in the area, whether there are gnats coming out of the soil, something flying around that you don't really know what it is, whether there's uh, whether the soil doesn't smell right. I mean, you really wanna pick that plant up and you really wanna look at it. A lot of times if there's an insect problem, um, you'll see it under the leaves or in the, um, the, the, the attachments between the leaf and the stem. And so you really wanna look carefully before you take something home. <clears throat> it's pretty important. Now, um, I just wanna um, give a tiny bit of a warning and I sort of gave you a little bit of uh, information about this to begin with, but when you get on the internet and you look for something and you're trying to pick a plant that you think is gonna do well in your environment, there are many, many, many uh, places where you can get bad information. So. Um, I, I don't mean this as a, as a mean thing. I mean, you, obviously, if you could go to the Master Gardener website, you probably do pretty good. Um, you go to your nursery and you talk to them. Some books, I'm going to recommend a book a little bit later that's really going to help you out a lot. Um, but you have to be careful because sometimes they'll put things on the internet that are, they're, they're, they're beautiful, right? And they're exciting and they're fun and they're like plant of the month or plant of the year. They're just a, very photogenic and all of that but they aren't really gonna be that easy to take care of. And I wanna just call out one plant in particular, which is a fiddle leaf fig. And I've just had a lot of people, um, it was very, very popular. Uh, it started a couple of years ago and people are just clamoring to get that plant. And so what happens is a couple of things. First of all, it's not that easy to grow. And so it needs really bright light. And if you don't have really bright light, you're not gonna have very good success most of the time with that plant. But the other thing that happens is, is that once the um, demand increases and then the production is maybe lagging a little bit. And so then the demand gets more, people want it, want it, want it, want it, want it. And then the growers are putting that plant out before it's ready, before it's acclimated. So not only are you getting a plant that's maybe a little bit difficult to begin with, but possibly it doesn't have a, an adequate root system yet. It's not really, fully acclimated and so you take it home and it really needs to acclimate in your home, which may be a problem. So do be careful about uh, the darlings of the plant world, what I call the darlings of the plant world. There are some tried and true beautiful plants that you can use that might do better for you. So, um, okay, so you're, you're at the nursery, you've decided what you're gonna buy, you've checked it out really well, you've purchased the plant and now you've gotta get it home. Okay, this is, this. I mean, in this 100 degree heat, I mean, this is problematic. So like you do not get to stop for shopping on your way home between buying your plant and taking it home to your house. You have to go directly home. And people will say to me, well, I put it in the trunk. It's like, I mean, I want you to think about that for a second. It's super hot in the trunk. You wouldn't put your anything else in the trunk, your ice cream in the trunk, would you? Well, maybe for a few minutes, but not for very long. It's not shady. It's hot, hot, hot. And so even if you make one little tiny stop at the post office and you park in the shade and you open the windows and whatever else, that plant is way, way more hot than it needs to be. And in the winter months, sometimes they can get too cold. And especially with your blooming plants, like your orchids and such, we don't even transport orchids if it's over about 90 degrees. We don't even try. 10 minutes from my shop to wherever I'm going, and I take a chance on that plant failing. 
So get your plant home as soon as you can. Buy your plant in the morning if you can or in the evening, at, at not during the hottest time of the day. Once you get it home safely, you know, um, assuming that you haven't fried it or frozen it, okay, um, you're going to isolate that plant for a little bit from your collection if you have one. Um, and it, usually I recommend that you spend about, maybe put the plant aside somewhere um, away from your other plants for about two weeks. That's usually enough to um, accommodate any of the life cycles of the common insects that we have on houseplants. So um, there's a few things that, 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 that you can do to help your plant to get used to your new environment and to assure yourself that you're not gonna have any problems. One is you can actually take that top quarter inch or half inch of soil out of the plant that you've brought home, because generally speaking, if there's a problem with gnats or if there's a problem with insects, the eggs are gonna be there, the larvae are gonna be there, they, like, they need air as well as water and, and such. And so you're gonna, if you scrape out that top part of the soil and replace it with a, a bagged potting soil that you feel good about, something that you've gotten at the store, um, not the soil from your yard, or you can use horticultural grade sand, which is inert and which is gonna help you to, uh, you know, to uh, discourage any sort of insect problems. Um, it has to be horticultural grade sand. Once again, not your sandbox sand. And um, you replace that top quarter inch or half inch of soil. The other thing that you're gonna do when in the process of doing that is uh, any fertilizer that's left in the top there, because a lot of times these plants come in over fertilized, you're going to remove. And what that gives you is the chance to know exactly, um, you know, within a few months maybe, um, to, to control the fertilizer situation because you don't want to over fertilizer. Over fertilizes, over fertilization is, um, is a big problem. It burns the roots. And we're going to talk a little bit more about fertilizer as we go on. So you scrape that top bit of soil out, then you leach out the soil. So you put it in your sink if it's small enough to do or in your bathtub or outside, if you do have to do it outside, it's gonna be in the shade in a cool part of the day. And you're gonna flush th water through the soil so that you leach out any sort of uh, remaining soluble salts in the soil. And you're starting fresh, which is awesome. And you're also gonna get a chance to wash that plant. So you can just use water um, you know, spray it off a little bit or use a spritzer or whatever, be sure to get under the leaves and just, just really clean your plant really well. And that's going to give you a nice fresh start uh, with your plant. Okay, so once that couple of weeks is over and you move it into its new environment, um, there's quite a few, um, there's quite a few um, things that you can do uh, that you can control in your home environment that are going to help your plant to survive better. And probably the most important thing that you need to consider is light. I used to think when I first started in business that I was just, well, you know, that I was, I was in control of the situation and that I could make that plant grow and I could fertilize properly and water properly and everything would be fine. And what I found was that wasn't really the case. If I didn't have light, which a lot of times was the case in some of these offices where we care for plants, I just couldn't, I, I had such a hard time being successful, which is one of the reasons why we, um, you know, rotate out these plants, you know, because they just can't survive very well in these low light environments. Now, the artificial lighting does provide some usable light for plants, um, but it's not nearly as good as most windows. So, I would say that lighting is the most important thing you can provide for your plants. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the quality of light in the different places where you, um, where you might put them. So um, when I talk about an unobstructed, an unobstructed um, uh, 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 exposure, I'm talking about um, a, a window where you don't have overhangs, where you don't have a tree maybe blocking the light, where you don't have, um, some kind of shading, you know, 60% UV blocker or whatever on your window, you have to take all that into consideration. Or if you close your drapes, that's no longer an unobstructed window, right? So sometimes they, people do that to protect their furniture, to protect their carpets or what have you. So you've got to consider all of that. Your east window is going to be probably your most useful for 
the most plants. Okay, so like your orchids and your African violets and almost anything because the eastern exposure is going to be cooler. The light is going to be very, very bright and very nice for the plants. You're going to get uh, several hours of sun in the morning, and it's going to be really nice for most of your plants. And then they're going to be protected in the afternoon. So your southern exposure is going to be your is is going to be very good as well. Um, there's just a few things to consider when you're putting a plant in a southern exposure. One of which was really a, a surprise to me. It took me a while to uh, to kind of uh, figure this out. Is that in the winter months? Your southern exposure, the sun is going to be lower in the sky because it's it's you know its trajectory is lower in the winter, and so the sun is going to be coming further into your room. So you don't really need to have it as close to the window in order to get good light in your in your south exposure. So that can be very beneficial, especially in the winter when we have those shorter days and the plants are kind of complaining about that. So. Your southern exposure, there's almost, if you have a good unobstructed southern exposure, you can grow almost anything really indoors, honestly. Okay, so your western exposure is going to be a little bit limiting because the, the light is hot and you're going to be getting that late afternoon sun. And just like outside, it can burn your plants. It can burn your plants inside as well. But your asparagus fern and your ficus and your succulents and your uh, cactus and those sorts of plants are going to be just very, very happy. Lipstick plant um, does excellent in that sort of an environment in your western windows. Your northern exposure, um, more for your low light tolerant plants. And you will notice that I say low light tolerant, not low light loving. This is very important. We've uh, brought all of these plants in from the outside and we've acclimated them to a lower light intensity. And um, no plant can really do well without some light. So there's some plants that are more tolerant of those low light conditions than others. And those are the ones you want in your Northern exposures. Your Dracaena, your Chinese evergreen, um, your Spathophyllum, your philodendrons, not the variegated ones, but the other ones, uh, your green philodendrons. Um, and those are plants that'll do well in a Northern exposure. So, um, okay, so the lighting is important. And um, a lot of times if you're having trouble with your plant, it has to do with light. So you can also uh, ameliorate your lighting situation by adding in light. There's um, full spectrum, natural spectrum lighting that you can use in your, in your existing fixtures to help your plants to do better if you want it in a certain place where you're not getting enough light from a window or you can move things, you can rotate. I, I, I've had clients that have had one plant in a room where there's a Northern exposure and one where there's a, a Southern or an Eastern and they just switch them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know, every month or so. And they do well that way. So, okay, so lighting is big. Um, the thing I think that, um, that I find interesting is that most of the questions that we get are about uh, watering. And watering is challenging and it can also be um, kind of scary for people. They don't know how to do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a rule of thumb and this is sort of a rule of thumb for all plants. Now it may not work for all plants. You're going to have to adjust. So I don't want you coming back to me and saying, now you told me Lorianne, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna need to adjust a little bit. All right, so the rule of thumb is you're going to check your plants once a week. You're gonna pick a day, a Saturday, a Monday, it doesn't matter. You're gonna pick a day, you're gonna get up in the morning and you're gonna check your plants for water. Now, some people like to use a moisture meter and if you're, if you're finding success with that, in fact, I'll sort of throw in a little disclaimer here. You know, if I say something today that, 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 that doesn't seem right to you, if something else is working for you, well, then you just go ahead and keep doing that, okay? This is for people who need the advice, who are having problems. This is something to kind of fine tune what you're already doing. So if a moisture meter works for you, I've never really been able to quite figure it out to tell you the truth. My, I'm gonna hold up my favorite moisture meter, my finger, okay? If you're dry down to about the second knuckle, a couple of inches, in any size pot really, okay, then it's probably time to water. 
And this is once again, this is 90% of your plants, not all of them, but this is, this is a pretty good rule of thumb, if you will, or rule of finger as the case may be. Okay, so you're gonna water and when you water, you're going to water thoroughly. So that means that however big the pot is, you're gonna water enough for all of the roots in that pot to get wet. You're gonna water so that the entire soil body is saturated with water. And this is because you want roots, your root system, just like outside, your root system is the, the driver of a healthy plant, period. And so when you have a healthy root system, you're going to generally have a healthy plant or a chance of dealing with problems that you might get up, up top. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna water thoroughly, you're gonna make sure that you have some sort of protection, okay, uh, a saucer or a, um, you know, something, or you're gonna take it to your sink or you're gonna take it to your bathtub or whatever you're gonna do to water it so that you don't ruin your surfaces. And this is really important because people get very frustrated when they bring something home and they're really excited about it and then they've got their floor ruined. Um, it's important to note here when we're talking about watering and surfaces that your ceramic pots, even those that are glazed may sweat and so you still need something underneath, whether it's a, just some felt feet or something to get a little bit of air circulation underneath. Really, really important to make sure that you take care of the nuts and bolts of protecting your surfaces, your floors and your furniture. So you're gonna water until water goes all the way through. Okay, and I'm assuming a container with drainage. You're gonna have a lot more uh, success if you have a container with drainage, particularly with succulents. And this is kind of one of my little pet peeves. There's a lot of uh, succulents out there in the stores and stuff that are in these um, containers that don't have drainage. It makes it very, very hard to manage. So if you can transplant something into a, a, something with drainage or drill a hole so that you've got drainage in whatever pot you're using, you're also gonna have a lot better success. So you're watering the entire soil body and then you're gonna let it dry out again, back to that two inches down dry, okay? So um, in the winter months, that might take two or three weeks, seriously. I mean, I remember talking to farmer Fred, he only waters his plants once a month, okay? And he, well, he only has three plants, but, um, but you know, basically th that once a month, is probably gonna be better in some ways than two or three times a week, okay? So you wanna water thoroughly and then let it dry out. Now, the reason for this, just quickly, is that plant roots need water and air, both. So when you water, you're filling up all those air spaces in the soil, all right? And the roots are soaking up that water and then you're getting those air spaces back as they soak it up and bring it up into their leaves and transpire. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep that in mind. We need air and water, both, all right? So that's gonna give you a healthy root system. If you water a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more, cause you're nervous, you're only gonna have roots in the top two inches of the soil. And that's not gonna be really great for your plants. Okay, so watering, I, I'm, I'm hoping that's helpful. Um, when you water, uh, you're probably gonna wanna do some fertilization and we usually fertilize uh, maybe, you know, uh, it depends on the fertilizer. You can follow the instructions on the fertilizer, but I would recommend whatever fertilizer you're using that you just cut whatever the recommendation is in half. So if it says, put a teaspoon of fertilizer in a gallon of water, use a half a teaspoon. Okay, a little bit less is better because those fertilizers, the soluble salts uh, build up in the soil. And if you over fertilize, you're gonna start burning those root hairs and you're gonna have some problems. So this is the other reason why a lot of times we recommend that you leach out the soil every, you know, a, a couple times a year or whatever to, to just leach out because you get soluble salts in the water as well. In fact, fluoride in our water, though it may be good for people, is really a problem for plants. And um, we have a lot of spotting on dracaenas and Chinese evergreens and such from fluoride in the water building up in the soil. And unfortunately, there's not a good way to... Um, to keep the fluoride out of the soil. Um, reverse osmosis only takes about 60%. Distillation is not really practical. And um, setting the water out overnight, which takes care of the chlorine, is just gonna concentrate the fluoride. The only thing that we've found in commercial use that helps is to keep the pH down a little bit, a little bit below seven. And um, that tends to uh, limit the uptake of fluoride. So anyway, if you want more information about that, there's there's, uh, you can contact the Master Gardener program and we'll, we'll talk to you further about that. So fertilization, 
follow the directions once a week when you water once a month, um, you know, but less is more for sure. And then from October through March, we recommend cutting back on not fertilizing at all because even indoors, plants tend to have like a little bit of a dormant period, if you will, where they're not really putting on too many leaves and they're not putting on very many roots and they really just need less water and they need less, no fertilizer really at that point. And part of that is the shortened days, they're not getting as much light, so they're not making as much sugar. Okay, uh, let's see, transplanting. Uh, I'm gonna talk about transplanting just briefly. It's kind of highly overrated if you wanna know the truth. Um, I think that if your plant is performing the way that you want it to, transplanting is probably not necessary. You may need to add some soil because the soil does tend to break down. And um, so you may need to add some soil periodically, but as far as actually transplanting, um, I don't think that that's really critical. Now, as far as, uh, I mean, you know, like I say, unless the plant is in nasty soil to begin with, or you're having some sort of a problem that directs you to transplant. So the thing about adding soil that's really important is you don't want to add too much because you don't want to rot the stems. So maybe, you know, an inch or two inches or whatever at the most, you know, whatever's degraded in once a year or twice a year is probably a good time to check that. Or you can actually pick the plant up out of the planter and put the soil on the bottom. That'll work as well. Um, you might want to break the roots up a little bit on the bottom. And when you do transplant, that's really important too. Don't be so gentle. Break up the roots. You know, it's really important. These plants like to be treated rough. They really do. They want their soils, their soils to be loose and they want their roots to be able to move about in the soil. So there's nothing wrong with roughing up the roots a little bit. And transplanting is much more successful. Like I would say the biggest thing about transplanting, if it does become necessary, is to make sure that the soil that you're planting into is damp or wet and that the soil that you're taking out, the, the plant that you're taking out is wet. Because that's gonna, that transplant shock that people talk about is mainly from the dieback of the air roots or the, not the air roots, the, um, the, the root hairs. And the root hairs in contact with air, if they're not damp, will die back very quickly. And that's really what we, what we talk about mainly with transplant shock. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just go really quickly through, let's see, okay, transplanting, cleaning, okay, trimming. You wanna keep your plants clean, this is pretty important. And this is gonna lead into just a, a very short, um, you know, a discussion of insects and disease problems that your plants may get. Um, you're going to, really be ahead of the game if you clean your plants on a regular basis. And please, I'm going to ask you, don't use milk, don't use mayonnaise, don't use oil. Um, anything that would clog the pores in your skin is going to clog the pores in the plant and they do breathe through their leaves. So really just a dry, uh, a dry towel, a dry soft towel or, um, or, or dampened would be fine. And be sure to get the bottoms and the tops of the leaves. Now I'm going to show you a little thing that I like, and it, you can just make this super easy. It's like, or or not, you know, you could um, you could just use a piece of felt. This is just felt, the plain felt that you can get at the store. You can see it's kind of used. Sorry about the dirt, but I just put it over my hand like this, and then that way I can just wipe the leaves. It's really quite quite easy. Um, so I don't know if I can show it to you actually, but I'm going to try. See this. Let's see, let me see, on oh, maybe this leaf, like that. And then you get the bottom too. And if you have one on both hands, you can do the bottom and the top at the same time. How about that? So um, cleaning your plants is really important. Also looking at them is really useful because if you can catch an insect problem before it gets really full blown, before it's visible really to you from across the room, you're gonna be better off. Like for example, spider mites, you know, this is an insect that can make potentially 10,000 eggs in a week. Let that sink in for a second. Okay, so if you catch that early, you're gonna have a much easier time of controlling it, right? Okay, so the main insects that we have indoors are um, spider mites, which I just mentioned, we'll start there. And that's gonna give you kind of a silvery look on the top of the leaf and some uh, webbing and that sort of thing. Scale is usually sticky. Okay, and mealybugs are usually cottony and um, cleaning is really the biggest thing. You use cleaning, okay? You can use a leaf cleaner if you really need to that's got some oil in it and that'll suffocate the little babies and that would be good too. Okay, I have to move on because I wanna show you some stuff and this is really the fun part. It's like the show and tell. 
And so I wanna show you these plants that are gonna be really good for you to try to grow at home, okay? So this plant right here is called Zamia colchis, Zamia folia, that's quite the little, uh, the mouthful, ZZ or fat boy. Doesn't take a lot of water, doesn't take a lot of light. Um, it will like more light and it will do well. It's also um, very, very easy to separate and grow new ones for your friends. And it's technically a succulent and actually can grow from the leaf. So you can actually pull a leaf off, put it in the soil and it will actually sprout roots. Okay, so that's kind of a cool plant. We use that a lot. This is one of my favorites. This is Aglaonema or Chinese evergreen. And the Chinese evergreen, there's a lot of different varieties. Some are dark green, some have white, white uh, stems, some have pink variegation. They're really just bulletproof. Aglaonema, Chinese evergreen, look it up. There's many, many different varieties available. They're usually fairly inexpensive and they will really tolerate the low light. And once in a while they get mealybugs, but for the most part, they're pretty, they're pretty healthy. Okay, um, this plant, Spathophyllum, which you know, a lot of times, see that peace lily? Okay, but you see how this one is variegated? Okay, and it's kind of got these wrinkly leaves. It still has the beautiful blooms, which really have a nice smell too, actually. But um, this one is really, really fun because it's called Domino and it probably has other varieties that are variegated. But if you ask for that variegated one with that wrinkly leaf, they hold up better than the other ones. They're not quite the drama queens that the regular spathophyllums are. And so I find that they, they'll, they'll go a couple of weeks between watering where those other ones really won't. Um, I have a couple of, I have this eucomus, which is kind of an unusual plant. It's called a pineapple lily. It's not classic for indoors. It could go indoors or outdoors, but if you want something as opposed to using a, um, uh, an orchid or a, or a bromeliad, you want something new, well, this is kind of a fun thing. And I just wanna point out that it's kind of, see how I'm getting some yellow leaves here? That's because this is a bulb and it's starting to die back. So it'll come back and it makes more and more and more and you can put it outside and it's really quite reliable in that way. So that's kind of fun. And then I know I, I just had to bring this because I know I talked to you about the darlings of the plant world. This is supposed to be the plant of 2021. This is Ficus umbellata. And um, I will say about this that I, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with this performance. This ficus umbellata has done a much better indoors than I thought that it would. I've had it in my office for a couple of weeks and it's got a lot of new leaves. Although I have to confess that it did have spider mites. So you've got to keep, keep track of the bottoms of the leaves. That's where you're going to see it primarily and keep them really clean, okay? Bright light. Okay, I saved the best for last. This is my favorite plant of all time. And there's actually, and you probably can't see it, but it's in it, back in the back. Uh, Judy has one too. It's called satin pulthos, or sometimes I think right now they're calling it um, silver splash or something like that. They, you'll find that the names of plants change a lot. The silver splash, it's syndapsus pictus, satin pulthos. This is just the most amazing plant. In the sun, it just looks silvery and beautiful, and it tolerates very low light, and it's just... Um, it hardly takes water. I've never had an insect problem on it. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful plant. Okay. So where are we, Kathy? Okay, we're ready for questions. Well, Lorian, that was great. Lots of good <laughs> information. Um, we have a, a, quite a few questions. So let, let's try to work through them one by one, okay? Yeah. How does somebody get rid of white crawlers on a monstera? Okay, um, if, if you're talking about uh, mealybugs, which is what I think you're talking about, the only insect indoors that's actually white would be mealybugs. And they do, as they, as they progress, they get more cottony uh, looking, okay? Now there is a kind of an oyster shell scale, but I've never seen that on uh, on Monstera. So I'm thinking it's probably mealybugs. Um, clean as well as you can, first of all, okay? And what I would do is I would use that, like that rag that we were talking about earlier, but I would put some rubbing alcohol on there so that you're actually killing on contact the bugs that you're removing. You could also use like a Q-tip with uh, rubbing alcohol and water on it and get into the cracks and stuff like that. But it's very, very important. And if you wanna use a spritzer, something that I've, um, that I've used uh, with some success is half rubbing alcohol, half water with a little drop of soap which acts as a surfactant. And we're not, we don't have time to get into that, but 
that you can just spritz it really good and mainly cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And then earlier when I was talking about pulling out the soil, this is the time when you want to take that top layer of soil out because those bugs are falling down into the soil. Okay, and so they're repopulating and mealybugs can, there is a mealybug that affects the roots as well. So you wanna be careful about that. That's great. We have some uh, African violet questions. Okay. Do they need to be transplanted to larger containers as they increase in size or should the container be just as it, should the container be such that it just fits the existing root ball? Simply put, put could a container be too large for an African? Violet. Absolutely. Um, this is kind of neat. This is a, a subject near and dear to my heart because my aunt um, bred violets and was very, very involved and, uh, in, in, in violet growing. And what she used to tell me is the plant can be three times the size of the pot. Mm -hmm. So literally she would have these, um, uh, these little supports, okay, that would go on the outside of the container, you know, kind of, and, and they're flat. And then, so the leaves would have something to rest on and they would be literally three times the size of the pot. Now you do need to change out the soil for fertility reasons, okay? But you don't need to transplant into a bigger pot until it's three times as big as the pot. How often and when do you know you need to do that soil switch out? Well, you know, this is a huge topic. I mean, I could do a whole talk on African violets, but what happens is, is there's, there's a lot of things that happens. They get elongated and then you've got to deal with what they call that turkey neck. You know, I mean, there's ways to, and they, they have um, undifferentiated tissue so they can start roots from anywhere basically. So you can bury them deep in the soil as well. And it's not going to rot them generally speaking. It's very, very important. This is where that East window comes in handy okay. and, um, and where you don't want to overwater. They're not as tender as you think. I know that didn't exactly answer the question, no, but- that's okay. um, I think you answered it with the first statement. This is a huge topic. Yes. Um, uh -huh. Are there any special fertilizers or for African violets or is it just proper watering and light and we're gonna be fine? You know, if you want the best performance out of your African violets, you need to use an African violet fertilizer. And they, there, if you, if you will look for that, there are some different products on the market. Um, um, that are specific for African violets. I'm going to make the same recommendation I made with regular fertilizer though, use half of what's recommended. It'll save you money too. Okay. Um, question about, and if I'm pronouncing wrong, I'm sorry, um, Schifflera. No, you got that perfect. Okay. That's awesome. I have a Schifflera that's almost always sticky. I've washed it, I've leaked oh. the soil, I've tried vinegar with Dawn dish soap, I've tried neem oil, and I can't win the battle. This, you know what, we just we just answered this question. I just answered this question for somebody. This is so funny. Um, I Like I've been prompted, you know? The stickiness is almost always scale, okay? Because your mealybugs and your spider mites do not create stickiness. They create other problems. Even your thrips, which are less, common do not create stickiness. It's scale, my, my guess would be. And what you're looking for is some little kind of brown spots. They're sort of raised usually under the leaf or on the stem. And that's going to be your, your sure thing about scale. But if you look up scale, like if you go to the Master Gardener website, there's a great article on scale. Okay. And you can look and you can see the pictures and see the, uh, if that's what you're looking at. Now, the thing to me, remember about this quickly is that Scale is not one thing, okay? That scale is being created by the little mommy scale to protect her babies, okay, the crawlers. And in the crawler phase, what happens is, okay, so they've got that little scale over the top, they get big enough to crawl out, and now they're all over the stem or all over the leaf, okay? And they're not easy to see. You can't see them with the naked eye most of the time, okay? And so what you do is you remove that scale, now you've just spread all those crawlers with your towel or whatever it is all over the place, okay? And so now you're going, well, how, how did that happen? How did, how, how did they get, I just, I already took them off. It, well, because you just spread all those crawlers and now all those crawlers are doing the same thing. They're gonna be mommy scales too, okay? And so basically what you need to do is, and I, I, I don't like using chemicals, okay? But 
this is a time when a systemic poison is not a bad idea. And you need to go to your nursery and you need to get one that's labeled for indoor plants and you need to follow the directions exactly. And you need to make sure that you're not going to be exposing that plant to animals or children who might get their hands in the soil or eat the leaves. But a systemic is really part of the multi-pronged approach to creating uh, a healthier plant in this case, okay? Because once it starts getting really sticky like that, the problem has probably gone too far, right? You, you know, and I, I hear that the person has tried many things and stuff, but they just haven't worked. And um, the other thing is, is that that alcohol that I was talking about, you take, and here is, use a rag that you can throw away or a paper towel. You can spritz and then wipe, okay? Or wipe and then spritz or spritz and wipe and then whatever you may, you're gonna have to do some combination of that with the rubbing alcohol so that you kill those crawlers as you go. And here again, pull out that soil. They're all dropping into the soil. And just plain warm soapy water will get that stickiness off of your furniture and off of the container. It's really, it's actually, it's actually pretty easy that stickiness to get off. Perfect. Is that I, I think that gives hopefully, I think it was Sheila. Uh, well, so one other thing I just want to oh. mention really quick. I'm so sorry um, no, to interrupt. I, is that um if you are looking at the leaves and you th where the stickiness is, the scale is usually above that, okay. okay? And so it's not sitting there making the stickiness, it's coming down, right? And so if you look up and you go, oh my gosh, there's 20,000 scales on that leaf, take it off. Don't bother to try to take the scale off the leaf, take the leaf off. Schefflera is a very hardy plant, okay? And so you've got plenty of leaves. Just take that one off. And a lot of times what you'll find is it's concentrated in a certain area, like it's one quarter of the plant. They just are there. And so if you can take part of those things off, you're minimizing your damage, right? Because they're sucking juice out of the plant. Right. Perfect. Um, so I am going to jump here to this question. Do you have a recommended organic fertilizer for houseplants to cut down on salt buildup in the soil? Um, not really. Okay. I mean, what I'm going to say is I, I, the fertilizer that I use is not 100% organic. Um, it's just, it, it, it it's a very, what, what, what you need to do, and I think Quentin, when I heard, I heard him mention about looking at the numbers on the fertilizer, you know, the, the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you know, you, to look at those, that the three numbers that are on your fertilizer. For houseplants, it's really important that those numbers be low, like two, three, two, or, you know, two, 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 or whatever, nothing more than five, you know, in any of those categories. And that it includes some micronutrients too, because we do need all those micros as well, even in very small doses. So what I would suggest is to go to your reputable nursery, whoever you like, look at their fertilizer section. There are some organic alternatives, okay? And um, pick something that's good for indoor use. And once again, just use half of what they recommend, even with the organic. You're still going to potentially build up salts. You, the water itself, even if you, you know, if you use distilled water, you're not getting your micronutrients and you have to, it's almost like doing hydroponics. You know what I mean? You don't really want to go there. Um, and if you use purified, so, uh, purified water, you're still, you still have some salts in there. They're there. There's nothing you can do about that. And it's going to build up to a certain degree in your soils, unless you're doing everything just perfectly. And that's where the leaching gives you a little bit of, you know, you leach, you take it every six months or so, put it in the sink, leach out the soil, and you've kind of fixed that problem. Okay. Right. Can I? So, go go ahead. ahead. So we're at time, but I'd like to squeeze in a couple more quick questions. Are you Can I just say one thing? Can yep. I just, okay, I don't know. Is, does this come up backwards? Yes. No, it's perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, this, if you don't buy any other book, and I don't even know if it's in print anymore, but you can probably find it online. Um, this would be like the one book I would recommend. There's a lot of books out there that have what I would consider to be bad information or not enough information. This book has a lot of really great pictures. I can't really show you, but there's like a troubleshooting section and there's a lot of great pictures and I haven't found any blatantly wrong information in this book yet, okay? Some of these books that are printed in like other places like the UK and stuff like that, they're dealing with different climates. You know, I mean, even between here and San Francisco, 
we have a difference in what we can do and what we can't do. Right. So this is a good book, Ortho's Guide to Successful House Plants. Okay. That's great. Um, someone has a ficus benjaminia. Yep. That's about seven feet tall. They typically prune to shape every other year, taking off about a third of it at a time. It's still thriving, but the person's wondering how long I can continue this practice. It grew from a six cents pot, which I purchased in 2004. Forever. Okay. Forever it is a It sounds like they're doing, I mean, I, would I be able to, would I, I would, okay, can I come take care of your plan? No, <laughs> anyway, no, that's perfect. It sounds absolutely perfect. And the only thing is too, and, and you're probably doing it if, if, if your plant's doing that well, you're turning it, you know, rotating it, rotating. We didn't talk about that, but it's good to rotate your plants, especially if you've got a bright window because they'll press their leaves up against yeah. the window and then they self shade. So you start losing leaves. People, oh, my plant all of a sudden started losing leaves. Well, if they're on the side that's away from the window, that's why they're self shading. All right. And our last question, um, you mentioned transplanting was not necessary, but when a plant starts to develop circling roots, that might harm the plant over time. Would this be a time to consider transplanting? Yes, and I don't mean that it's never necessary. It's just that people tend to, they, they go, I, I've had people that bring a plant home and they're like, oh, I need to transplant my plant. No, you really don't. And especially you, the same thing we talked about with African violets, you don't want to plant into a big pot. If you've got a six inch plant, please don't transplant into anything more than an eight. And from an eight into a 10, two inches max, don't go any further up. You think that you're going to plant into this big, big pot and the plant's going to get big, 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 and you're never going to have to transplant again. It's going to die. That's not how it works. So basically you don't want to transplant just unnecessarily. So if something's going wrong, like circling roots is a really good reason to transplant. Now your plant can tolerate that indoors because you're controlling all of the environment, right? A little bit better than it can outdoors. And you're not worrying about it, like falling over onto your house or something like that, like you would for a tree, but that is an excellent reason to transplant. Well, Lori Ann, you've been a wealth of houseplant information. I know you showed the book that you thought would be good for people. We also posted in the Q and A, the most recent master gardener um, uh, brochure pamphlet. Um, let me see. The UCIPM recently posted a pest notes titled Houseplant Problems. And there's a link in the Q&A for all the attendees. Hopefully you've seen that. And of course, send any more houseplant questions into the UC Master Gardener email and we'll get them answered. Maybe even reaching out to Lori Ann to get those answers for you. So thank you it. so much. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate your work too. You're welcome. All right. Bye Lori Ann. Bye. Thank you. Well, everyone, we're at another five minute break. And what we'd like to do is jump to a share screen. And we're going to have Oh, wait, I forgot we have another poll. So I'm launching another poll poll number three meant to do that before I shared screen. Here you go, poll number three. You have two questions. What issue causes you the most trouble with your house plants? Ann was so great in giving us lots of information. We wanna know where to take you next. So is it insufficient light, pesky insects, watering frequency, no troubles at all, I'm a house plant expert. And then would you like to see the UC Master Gardeners conduct more house plant classes? So while you're thinking about those poll questions and doing your multiple choice, Judy's gonna tell us a little bit about not flushing medications down the toilet. Judy, take it away. <laughs> thank you, Julie. But before I do that, I gotta thank you for being a fabulous facilitator today. You've kept us moving forward and you're smiling a lot and that's good energy, so thank you. And I'm so proud of all of our master gardeners we have working on Harvest Day. Uh, behind the scenes, it takes quite a few people to make these easy productions look so easy. And a special thanks, as you mentioned earlier, to Kathy and Mary for being our uh, Harvest Day coordinators this year. It's all done by volunteers. And I can't wait until we're out into the public again so we can see our um, residents that we live with. And um, I want to say that to back up everything we've done today, we've got our YouTube channel with the videos, and we are absolutely going to have to get Lori Ann on a houseplant video. I think that's that's a done deal. We've got to get that done. 
But thank you, Julie, for letting me talk about um, medicines. As gardeners, we have aches and pains. My guess is many of you have had knee surgeries or hopefully not hip surgeries, but maybe hips. And shoulders tend to go bad with gardeners too because we're up pruning all the time. And if that's the case, then chances are you've probably got leftover medicine bottles in your cabinet and you're not sure quite what to do with them. Well, make sure you dispose of them properly. Promise me, absolutely promise me, you will not dig a hole in the backyard and bury your medicine. I've had people tell me they do that and it makes my blood run cold. So there are many places you can safely take your used medicine. The um, household hazardous waste sites that we showed you in the last commercial, most of them all take medicines, but the best thing to do is Google don't flush your meds and you will get a website that'll show you the household hazardous waste sites. It'll also uh, show you pharmacies that are taking used medicine and the county and the city periodically have sites open where you can take the medicine. Um, I do wanna just emphasize too that if you're transporting medicine and any of the pesticides and paints, et cetera, to these sites, please make sure you have them sealed and away from the kids that are in the cars. So put them in the trunk of the car or the back of your truck, et cetera, so that none of the little kids can get a hold of anything while you're transporting them. And so uh, let's all work together and keep our medicines out of our soils and out of our creeks and our rivers. Okay, thank you, Julie. Absolutely, thank you, Judy. So we have exactly one minute to Ruth Ostroff. Um, is Ruth? set up and ready to go. Julie, hi. No, I don't see you, Ruth. No, no, I'm hiding. You're gonna do your PowerPoint, correct? Yeah, we're um, we're getting it set up. Our host has stopped us. Yes, can, okay. can our host please fix that? The host? Uh, what do you mean the host stopped? You cannot start your video because the host has stopped us. Oh, I was sharing. I was sharing my screen, but I'm not anymore. So you should be able to. Um, so our poll, while you guys are getting set up, I'm gonna close out the poll. So our poll. Thank you, 34 people, for responding. We have 50% of you concerned about insufficient light with your house plants, and 35 worried about frequency of watering, and then pesky insects and no troubles. Kind of were neck and neck there. And a resounding 76% of you want more houseplant information. Lori, ask, Lori and Asmus, get ready. We need more houseplant information. We have a shirt um, right here. So thank you very much start video. We can... for doing that poll. So we have, and I know they're, they're working on getting their video up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna chit chat for a minute till I see that video pop up or the PowerPoint. We have Ruth Ostra who's gonna be talking to us next about growing bearded irises in the home garden. Ruth Ostroff is a master gardener. Uh, she also, we also went through the program together many moons ago. Um, and she is also in the Sacramento Iris Society, very active. And for those of us who've had the great pleasure of visiting Ruth's home, it is a bearded iris, just treasure trove. Um, it's, it's amazing. So Ruth is going to talk to us about bearded irises. She has a PowerPoint and I understand a few video clips that she's going to be going back and forth to. So just like um, for Quentin and for Lori Ann's talks, please listen, absorb, think about it. And if you have questions, type them into the Q&A and we will have some Q&A time at the end with Ruth. Uh, Julie, sorry to interrupt you here, but do you see um, Ruth's yes. PowerPoint on your screen? Okay, thank yes. you. She is up and running. She's ready she, to go. If she can unmute again, that would be great. Sorry, I muted because we were here in background. So Ruth, go ahead and unmute. There you go. Ruth, how are you? I'm fine, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for um, that great introduction and kind of stalling there while we got our, our little no technology going. No problem at all. No problem at <laughs> all. Appreciate so it. I'm going to hand it over to you, Ruth, and let you enlighten us about bearded irises, and I'll come back at the end with Q&A. Sounds good. Um, we might still be having a little bit of technical. Can, um, but You're good. You're good on my end. Okay, um, but go back to the other one. Okay. 
Okay. Um, great. So uh, today I'm going to talk with you about growing bearded irises in your home gardens. And uh, my name, as you know, is, is Ruth Ostroff. I'm a Sacramento County Master Gardener uh, and also a Sacramento Iris Society board member. And uh, so I have, uh, hopefully I have some of my colleagues here um, online that are watching this too, and they can give me some good feedback. So if, what I want to do today is to focus on uh, five different areas. Uh, some of them will go quickly and, and some will take a little longer. I do have some uh, videos, a couple of video clips to show you. And uh, in the, uh, the intro, I'm going to give like a little bit of an overview of uh, irises. And then I'm going to give you a, a tour of my garden. The pictures that you're going to be seeing in the uh, today will be those that were taken in my garden mostly last April uh, when the garden was in full bloom. And then uh, we did do some in my potting shed to show how to dig and uh, divide irises. And so those will be hopefully informative and they were certainly very fun uh, to do. So well, here we go. So I have um, this just to kind of get you interested. I have a, a very short video of this part of my garden is where I have, I grow my uh, historical garden uh, historical irises. And these irises that I've planted here are in the 1960s. They were hybridized um, and introduced in the 1960s and below and older, much older, some of them in the 1600s. And uh, so I'll go ahead and play that little clip for you. You can just look at it. So lots of colors, lots of different styles. You'll notice that in here, the uh, the irises are more like, you know, when you talk about my grandmother's iris garden, kind of droopy and uh, not as uh, frilly and fluffy uh, as, as some of the newer irises, which I'll be showing you. So we'll go ahead and take a look at, at our first um, slide here. So there are a lot of species, uh, a different iris species uh, worldwide. And today the focus of our talk is we're just gonna take one of those uh, iris species and we're gonna talk today about bearded irises. So um, this plant, the, the word iris was coined um, by Carl Linnaeus, who is a Swedish botanist in the 1700s. And he, um, he named the, the genus iris um, in 1753. So the word iris has been around, but prior to that, it wasn't really, um, was it used like that? It was, it wasn't coined botanically. So irises are perennial plants. That might be a term uh, most of you know, and some of you may not. Um, the difference between a, a perennial plant and an annual plant is that a, an annual plant lives annually, grows for one year, an annual uh, year. And then uh, perennial plants come back year after year. They, they continue growing and producing the same um, plant year after year. And so irises are native to regions of the world that have climates similar to ours, especially Europe and Asia. So um, irises come in a variety of sizes, which um, I think is, is pretty cool considering what you might wanna do in your garden as far as height wise and bloom season, you'll notice that these are arranged in order of uh, height and bloom season. The little tiny miniature dwarf at the bottom, just super cute, tiny flowers, tiny leaves. Uh, then the standard dwarf bearded, uh, pretty sturdy. Most of those, uh, they, uh, they grow to about 12 inches. And you can see on the side where it, it talks about eight to 16 inches. And you can see the, the different as, as we go up and uh, in look. The, the one I wanted to point out, the miniature tall bearded, which is the diagram in the middle, those irises are, uh, are not, they're, they're more kind of petite looking. They're, they would be kind of like if you could take a tall bearded iris and just like shrink it proportionally down, you'd have this very uh, nice, sweet, petite iris. And these are also known as table irises because they make a very nice arrangement um, on your table. So there are a lot of very interesting colors and a lot of interesting kind of newer 
weird shapes. And I'm going to show you some of those. So this particular iris is um, has one a metal, which is uh, the highest metal given to um, an American um, iris. So uh, it, the um, this metal is called the Dykes metal. And this particular uh, iris is called Paul Black. Paul Black is a, a hybridizer in Oregon and uh, does some amazing things. This was introduced by a friend of his and uh, named after Paul. So these, uh, this slide, I really love this slide because it just gives such a variety of, uh, of colors. It shows you that you can really, if you can think of it, if you can kind of dream a combination of irises, then it probably exists. And uh, I wanted to say specifically though, that even though that iris in the top center looks very red, it, there are no true like Christmas red reds um, in the iris world yet. Although hybridizers are really trying hard to get a, a red iris. These irises are more um, kind of the burgundy maroon, uh, but pretty, pretty deep colored that way. So as you can see, I, I have little names on these. Uh, and I think the names are kind of fun. The hybridizers oftentimes will try to take a look at their iris and name them some sort of name that kind of relates to what the iris looks like. So up in the, the left-hand corner, Brown Lasso, which is also a Dykes Medal winner in earlier years, has um, a brown uh, edging on it. It has a ring around the, the edge and uh, that's the lasso. And then uh, the iris uh, coming, the red one is one of our newer varieties by a, a hybridizer that just moved a few years ago from here to Idaho or to, to Oregon. And hmm, Larry, sorry. Um, so, and it's Tiff. And then we have um, Precious Memories, which is, is just kind of sweet with the pink and the purple on the bottom. And then uh, Bottle Rocket, which looks like it's gonna take off. And this color on here doesn't even really do it justice. It looks like it's gonna explode right out of the ground. Um, marital Bliss, we find a lot of the pink irises, real frilly, kind of lacy on, on the edges. A lot of those are named, you know, for sort of romantic sort of themes like loving you. And um, a lot of them have to do with marriage or caring and that sort of thing. And then the, the one down in the far corner, Circus Stripes, uh, you, can, you can see why it's named that. Lots of different stripes. So, um, these are just a few more little kind of close ups. And these are um, some of my favorites. I think they're pretty, pretty brilliant colors and they really pop in the yard. So some of the shapes I was telling you, there's some interesting shapes. Um, the one on the left, this is it's not so much about the shape, but the color. We call this a broken color. So, uh, the top part, the tops uh, of the flower Oh, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but those are called the standards, the ones that stick up. And then the, the colorful broken part that you see uh, falling down are called the falls. And on these falls are particularly vibrant um, purplish kind of and white, sort of not really striped, but kind of just broken up. The, the middle uh, iris is a uh, pink um, flamingo. And you'll see that the orange part, the bright orange part on the falls is called a beard. And that's why we're talking about bearded irises today. All of these, all of these um, irises I'll be showing you all have beards. Um, some irises don't. But this beard on this particular one has a protrusion that comes off the end of the beard. And it, it makes a, a horn. Uh, some, and we call these space aged irises. Uh, and they, um, they also can have, instead of a protrusion like this, that's more like a straight horn, uh, sometimes they'll come off and it look like a little spoon at the end, and sometimes it looks like another petal, so we call those flounces, and they can, uh, they can really add interest to, to the iris, making it look much more full and, and very kind of interesting, odd, unusual. And then on the right, uh, the, this is a, something the hybridizers have been working on lately. This, this is an iris that has six falls. It doesn't have any standards. Each one of the falls on here has a beard. And the standard, uh, or the, the uh, well, the, the standard for irises is that they have 
they have three standards which stick up and then they have three falls and those are the ones that have the beards. So this is this flat one is very unusual in that it's um, you can kind of see the very light blue um, beards in there. This is a, a close up of one of those irises I showed you in the beginning in that little panorama. This is called T apron. It was hybridized um, in the probably hybridized in the late 50s, but it was introduced, registered, introduced in uh, 1961. And it's uh, it's still it has those like at the tip of the petals that are the tip of the uh, falls that are you know hanging down. They kind of make a little triangle, and those open as the flower gets older. And they're just very, very delicate looking. This is one of my very favorite historical irises. So, um, so in April, I was fortunate enough to have um, two master gardeners uh, come out, Kathy Stewart and Mary Welch, and they took videos of my yard in bloom. And I want to share those with you because I think the colors are just to give you an idea of when you're looking for irises for your yard, the there's just a lot of different options out there. Oh, oops, that's bad. Sorry, sorry guys. I missed uh, I missed the arrow. So there's a uh, in the middle there, black, really dark, dark purple. We call those blacks. It's not actually black, but some of them are so dark that's pretty black. Then yellows and and the oranges in the front, and then there's two tones and. Uh, lots of lots of colors and lots of choices on um, what to what to do, what to buy. So I I wanted to because I started touching on some terms, um, some of them may may or may not be familiar to you. Uh, I wanted to touch on just a little bit of botany here. So uh, let's go ahead and move forward on this. So um, the thing I want to start off with here just briefly is that a, a lot of people will talk about iris bulbs and, and you can say that it's not totally incorrect, but a true bulb, is, an iris is not a true bulb. And I just wanted to let you know so that if you're actually talking about irises, a rhizome is really the word, the term to use. And I'll show you on the next two slides the difference between a true bulb and, um, and a rhizome. So the um, bulbs have distinct parts that are um, different than rhizomes. So we have a basal plate right here on this picture where the um, roots grow from. We have fleshy scales that are just, so this shallot, if you can think of like you have onions, you cut in half a lot, um, cut down through the center of it in either direction, you'll see how they have overlapping fleshy scales. And then they also have, um, whoops, so they, they also have these uh, lateral buds that can come off. Lateral is on the sides. It, they actually would be coming off of the basal plate um, area. So rhizomes are different if, if, than bulbs. If you cut a rhizome in half, it would be just full fleshy, no, no uh, differentiation. It's a solid. So um, uh, if this particular iris rhizome, um, I took uh, and cut the leaves shorter, and I'm going to show you the different parts of this. They are a modified underground plant stem, and it that sends out roots and shoots. They um, they have leaves on the top. They have um, this is the where the growing the growing shoot for this particular rhizome. This is the current year's rhizome, which will bloom in the spring, next spring. Well, probably not this one, but because I didn't plan it. Then there's uh, the roots that hang down below. The roots are actually quite long. I uh, cut these roots shorter. Then uh, we, have, we have another example, and you'll see some better examples in the following vi videos, but the current year rhizome is, is in, in to the left, of this particular arrow. And last year's rhizome, um, they, the new year rhizomes grow off of last year's rhizome. And then you can see there's also uh, little, new little buds and, and things coming off the side and those will grow leaves and 
and they could very well uh, flower next year too. And uh, again, here are the roots. Uh, I think it's important to understand that iris rhizomes only bloom once. The actual rhizome uh, is is uh, kind of a the the rhizome will stick around, but it's really kind of a one shot deal. And it and the whole plant uh, growth and blooms for next year depend on these new uh, the new rhizomes growing off of the old one, and then they'll subsequently bloom. So the flower, um, and I, I put uh, hybridization, and 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 I'm going to talk about this so briefly. I'm I probably offend anyone who hybridizes irises, but um, but I just kind of wanted to show you the parts of the plant because they're they're really a little different than if you looked at your basic, uh, I don't know, I don't know daisy, which is totally different. Um, violets, any of those, they just have a totally different uh, setup. So the petals for this flower are where my fingers are holding out. That's the golden um, standards. Those are called standards. And uh, there are three of them on, like I said, on, on most irises, except for the flat ones, there, there should be three standards. And then the, the sepals, which is another part of the, the flower, they aren't actual petals. They're actually the, they, they ring around the base of the petals. And those are the falls. And on each of, um, so let me just point these with some arrows so you can see it better. The standards are here. And then, um, and then we have the falls. And then there is uh, the parts of the reproductive parts of the plant are here. This is the male part, the stamen. And at the top of the filament there that it's pointing to, there's an anther and the anther has pollen on it. And then the stigmatic lip uh, is the part, it's a very sticky part. Pollen gets attached to that and then it, it moves deep into the iris flower and will produce seeds for next year. I think one of my favorite parts, I have a lot of favorite parts of an iris, but the beard I was talking to you a little bit about before is, um, is really kind of a, like a pollinator landing pad. Like the bees or, or other pollinators will be attracted to its, its either brightness or fuzziness or, uh, and it kind of shows them like a red carpet, like where to walk in to find the pollen. So this is uh, this is one of my very favorite little video clips, and this was uh, this was just lucky. We uh, we were out in the garden taking these videos, and I'd happened to see, or uh, perhaps Kathy happened to see, that there was a a male carpenter bee trying to fertilize this iris, and so we were lucky that we were able to get a clip of it. So I'm going to play this. I'll probably play it a couple of times just really quickly because it's so short. But I want you to listen to how loud this bee is and um, and also, um, well, I'll show it to you first and I'll tell you a little bit about them. Oops, no, that didn't work. Sorry. Um, back. What am I missing this arrow here? Isn't that cute? I gotta zoom again. This is so cute. Nope, that didn't work either. Down here, put the B back there. I'm gonna play it one more time. You probably, or you may have these bees in your yard. These um, carpenter bees, the ones that we usually see are those huge black shiny bees. They're, they're large, just like this bee is. They are the um, females and this is the male. The males don't have stingers. So, um, and the females don't really bother anyone. Um, but anyway, if you do see one of these, they're pretty cool looking. So uh, as you could see from, the bee moving along, they enter the flower, they climb up the, the beard, they squeeze under the stigmatic lip. Pollen um, is scraped from all different irises in the yard as this pollinator moves around. And then um, as they travel into all the different irises with pollen on them and touch the stigmatic lip, they um, add pollen to the flower, travels, the pollen grains travel down into the ovary where fertilization may take place. If it's gonna take place, it does, but oftentimes um, not all irises are good plant parents. So we, um, 
even if you're trying to create a new iris, you, you may or may not be successful. But hopefully you will. So now we're going to move into a little bit about iris care. And we're going to talk about um, a few cultural notes. I'm going to talk about, um, um, then we're going to look at some diseases and pests that are common in our area. So just a, a few things to consider. Um, irises aren't very fussy, really. They'll, they can take quite a bit of abuse, but they love well-drained soil, the uh, you know soil that's too dense and holds water that doesn't drain is uh, is not it's not good for them. They'll uh, they'll tend to rot and then you'll lose your your rhizome. Um, they do require six to eight hours of sun. Um, they like moderate water. They um, they can go with uh, very low water, but then you won't have they'll they'll live, uh, but they they won't live. Uh, vigorously and produces nice flowers. Uh, they can also go without fertilizer for quite a while, but if you do fertilize them twice a year, then um, they'll produce much be more beautiful flowers for you in the spring. In the Iris Society, we like to tell people um, that we apply fertilizer twice a year on the days. So that would be Valentine's Day and Veterans Day. Um, that's not you know, written in stone or anything, but just try somewhere in the spring and sometime in, in the late fall or early winter to, um, to do some fertilization. So there are a number of diseases and pests to consider. And I, I think it's important that the diseases and pests we have here uh, in our area are, are not uh, necessarily the same diseases and pests, although some of them are um, in other parts of the country. There are some really um, uh, some pests that I'm so glad we don't have here uh, in, in our area, but these ones do cause us some problem. So from left to right, aphids, which I'm sure if you have a garden, uh, you, you probably have some aphids somewhere. And they, um, they suck. They're a plant that sucks um, juices out of the leaves and then slugs, and they rasp holes out of uh, into the leaf. And so you can see the slug damage, uh, so the slugs on the top and the slug damage, they just make holes in their leaves. And, uh, and then moving uh, clockwise to bacterial rot. Bacterial rot's an interesting thing. It, that happens with, uh, often that can happen with too much water sitting and not, not good drainage. It can happen if you have too much uh, mulch over the top of your, covering your rhizomes. Um, the thing about bacterial rot and actually rhizomes in general is that rhizomes are, they're pretty sturdy. I mean, you can take your knife like this person is doing and go in there and you can cut this soft, stinky, icky thing out. And you can put maybe a, a little bit of comet or some kind of maybe diluted bleach solution that you dab off with a paper towel and just kind of try to kill the bacteria. And it'll, um, the, the rhizome will oftentimes just totally recover which is, I think, pretty cool. And then moving again over to the left, um, fungal leaf spot is big in our area. And it's a, it's, it's a winter problem. It, water splashes the fungal uh, spores up onto the leaves during the winter, and then uh, they make whole brown spots all over your leaves. And it's very unsightly. So uh, we have in, we have, uh, vertebrate press, vertebrate, vertebrate pests also to consider uh, down in here in Sacramento on the ground, you know, floor here. Um, we don't have a lot of deer problem, uh, but up in the hills, uh, growing irises can be real challenging. Um, I'll start with the gophers on the left. Um, gophers are a problem for just about everybody around. Um, they they can be a problem, and uh, we we have a, a potting knife there, a little uh, trowel, just to show you the size of a gopher. And then uh, just to talk about some gopher controls, uh, the preference would be, uh, because it's, it's more organic and hopefully quick, uh, is a trap that goes in their tunnel and um, you can trap them that way. Then moving over to the deer, it's my, one of my favorite pictures um, from a friend of mine. This deer is holding an iris leaf in its mouth and uh, just, we like to think deer, uh, irises are deer proof or, or deer, 
fear resistant or uh, whatever the term is you want to use. And, and they are for the most part, but when a deer is hungry and there isn't a lot to eat, they're totally happy, as you can see on the bottom picture, gnawing down your iris pretty far. So here um, we have a couple of videos that I took. Uh, this, this will really probably give you an idea of, of just how, um, how to take care of your, your irises in the fall. I mean that, well, summer and, and fall. And I think um, I wanted to show you this picture. This is the yard before bloom started. So this is about, I don't know, probably in March. And then after bloom in the same, pretty much the same area, it shows the, the difference in color is pretty dramatic. It has nice green before bloom. And then after bloom pretty much took a lot out of the plants and then they kind of senesce or, or kind of rest and their leaves die back. A lot of their leaves will die back. Um, we don't tend to trim our leaves unless they start to look really unsightly. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of energy in the leaves that can be transferred down to the rhizome, the growing rhizomes. Um, but if you do trim them, um, I would recommend not trimming them all the way to the ground because you do want to have some of that energy left. So uh, what I want to do now is show you what to do after bloom uh, to take care of your plant, which needs to be um, cared for, divided and separated and replanted every three or four years. And now I'll show you why. So this is a clump of iris called Crimson King that's very overgrown. Like I have not divided this every three or four years, clearly. Um, you'll see as, as I do divide it and you'll get to take a good close look at that. Look at this overgrown iris. Let's get the pitchfork out and dig it up. Here is a piece of the clump that I dug up from the other part of my yard. And today I'm going to show you how to divide it. And, and I'm going to talk about why it's necessary. Tracking this. Okay. Here is a piece of the clump that I took out. And I wanted to show this to you so you could see how the rhizome continues to grow each year and reproduce. This is uh, this year's growth. And these will be next year's flowers, stalks coming off of this. You'll see here that this atta is attached to these. These were, this was last year's rhizome. And this right here, it's hard to see a little bit, but this is where the flower stalk came last year. And then if you go down a little farther, you can see another rhizome. And this was the rhizome from the year before. And that was where the flower stalk was the year before. And it would just continue on and on. And as you could see from the clump, the way it was overgrown in the middle, that these irises continue to grow sometimes over the top of each other. Sometimes they just grow out and make a ring of dead rhizomes in the center that will rot. So it's really important to take your clump apart every three or four years and to get rid of the old rhizome, the ones from the previous years, and then replant the new ones. So you'll have fresh, um, fresh growth. Now I'm going to take this clump apart. Lesson number one, don't be afraid to be rough with your iris. They're very forgiving. This is last year's growth. I'm going to get rid of it. There's a clump that shows a very long rhizome from before. We're going to get rid of all of this and only keep the parts that are new year's this year's growth and i'm going to continue to do that all the way through this clump getting rid of the old material keeping the newer material the fresher rhizomes as i said don't be worried you can't hurt the iris All the old leaves are in here, all of that goes away. Sometimes these are so small, they're not worth saving, even though they're new, I'll get rid of those. Sometimes you can keep 
if you want to, you can keep last year's growth on. If the rhizome is small, I might have left this one on, but I think this has got enough energy in it. It'll be fine. So now I'm going to show you how to actually clean them up and get them ready for replanting. Oops. Now I'm going to show you how to clean up your iris and get it ready for replanting. First step is to remove any of this old leaves. Then in order to make it more manageable, um, I cut down the fan and you could cut it longer or shorter. Like I said, lesson, don't worry. So I'm not gonna worry about what you do today. So this is how you would, if you ordered rhizomes, you would get a rhizome from a hybridizer or from a plant store that looked a lot like this. However, it would be cleaner. Oh, sometimes they'll, um, so I'm, I'm cleaning off the dirt here. Sometimes they will bleach the rhizome in a 10% solution of bleach before shipping them. Uh, it's, we, we don't, at the Sacramento Iris Society, we don't tend to do that. Uh, and then, so you have, uh, we'll continue on cleaning these up and then I'll show you how I replant them and the proper way to position them in the ground. Now it's time to plant. Using this pot as an imaginary ground, pretending you're planting in the ground, we're going to use three rhizomes to demonstrate how to do this. When you look at your rhizome, you'll see that the back part of the rhizome is like a heel where the fan comes down and it touches here. The front part, we consider, we talk about it like it's a toe. And when we plant, we plant the toe down and the heel up and we leave enough dirt off of the rhizome so the sun can hit it. You'll get a much better bloom and a healthier rhizome that way. Be sure not to plant your rhizome too deeply and cover the fan, part of the fan. You may run the risk of rotting your rhizome. So continuing on, I like to plant two or three rhizomes facing each other because as you'll recall, they bloom, they grow in the direction outward and you don't want to plant them back to back because they'll grow into each other. Be sure to water them in. And also you'll want to make a name tag. It's important to use pencil or a China marker to write the name of your iris on your, on your marker. And that way you'll know who you have. Now I'm gonna demonstrate how to plant in a pot, a single iris in a pot. You may buy a single rhizome from a store or you might buy it from the Sacramento Iris Society sale. And when you do, you'll notice that somewhere on the fan, the name of the iris is written. You'll also notice that the fans are kind of dusty. They have this white covering, a little bit of dusty covering on them. Before a name is written on them, we need to wipe this off and we use a permanent marker to write the name of the iris on, on it. We write the name in the center, one of the center flags, one of the center leaves, and not on the outside leaves because they tend to be the ones that dry up and fall off first. So if you buy your plant from a store or from an iris society, it will come with a name attached to it somewhere and then you'll know what it, it is when you plant it. When you plant it, when I plant, I like to put a paper towel piece or a coffee filter into the pot. And then I like to put my iris, a little bit of soil in the bottom. And then I like to add soil as I plant my iris because the soil is very difficult, especially if you have a really long root to dig enough with your hand deep enough into the pot to make it get down far enough. You want to make sure those roots are in 
You also do not want to cover your rhizome, as we talked about before, too deeply because or you don't want to cover the leaves, cover the rhizome or the leaves too deeply because you want to prevent rot. Now you have a potted iris to give to a friend or to keep for yourself to put later in your garden. Now I'm going to, oh. So um, just hopefully those, uh, those videos gave you a, a good idea on how you can go and kind of thin out your irises. Um, you can always give your irises to, uh, to a friend or you can donate them to the Sacramento Iris Society Rhizome Sale, which is in the middle of July each year. If you know the name of the iris, uh, we, we sell all of our irises with names on them. Uh, there, there have been some, people have asked me some questions about what are some things that would be good to plant uh, with irises. And, uh, and I have some suggestions. I want to show you uh, some good to know things. Um, also, so I also want to tell you, um, I'm going to show you another video in a few minutes, uh, another look at the April um, plants. So with companion plants, just like with the irises, you want to look for, um, the soil, sun, and water needs, they need to be similar. Uh, you'll, and the thing is you wanna keep in mind that since you'll be dividing your irises every three or four years, you want plants that aren't gonna grow into and over the top of your irises so that you'll be um, having a difficult time dividing your iris or disturbing your other plants. Um, annuals or perennials, so those would be plants that last for a year or plants that last longer than a year um, or live from year to year. Are, are good choices depending on what they are. Uh, you wanna choose plants that complement the color and texture of your irises. And some suggestions uh, might include, but are certainly not limited to uh, columbines, salvias, maybe a penstemon, some phlox, uh, chrysanthemums, uh, violas. Uh, and again, just make sure they're all not planted so close to, um, to each other that you can't divide your irises each year. So I wanted to give you a final look at, um, at the garden tour from April of, of 2021, kind of give a little bit of a different view. And uh, so you can take a look at all the colors and you can make some decisions about what colors you want to have in your yard. Oh, that didn't work. I'm having trouble getting these videos started. There we go. Oh, I had to uh, go out and just look at them in April because they don't last a long time. One of the things I wanted to say is that not only do they come in different sizes, but they also come at different bloom times. So if you look at the foreground in this, uh, what's left in, in this video, you'll notice that those plants in the front don't have uh, any bloom stalks on them. Well, there might be something coming. They've either not bloomed yet or they bloomed and they're done. So we have uh, early, uh, early blooming irises that in my yard uh, bloom at the end of March, first part of April, and then mid-season that'll come in in um, the middle of April. Uh, our Iris Society show at the Shepherd Garden and Arts Center is generally held on um, the third uh, Sunday, the third weekend of uh, April. And so the mid-season irises are usually in full bloom then. And then after that, those start to fade. And then we have the later blooming ones. Uh, some irises will bloom early and then again, mid, and then some again, late, same iris um, plant, different um, off a different rhizome. Um, and then there's very late. I even have a couple of irises blooming in my yard now um, in August, just a couple. And then come uh, next month, September, October, November, We'll get uh, some other irises blooming. I didn't talk about those earlier, but we do have irises that do rebloom. So they'll bloom in the spring and then they'll bloom again in the, um, in the winter months or the fall. So um, I wanna thank you for watching this. Um, and before I take questions, I wanted to show you a couple of other slides again, just pretty quick to go through 
uh, thanking, uh, showing where some of the references, and these will be posted on our YouTube, and you'll be able to go back and look at them again. But I, I want to be sure to, these are the refer references that I used for this uh, particular presentation. And then um, I do want to particularly thank um, especially Kathy Storer and Mary Welch, who came out and spent countless hours with me in my yard taking pictures of flowers and pictures of um, videos and just generally giving me encouragement all the way. And unless otherwise indicated, uh, all of the photo credits are, are either theirs or mine. So thank you guys. And also I, I'd be really neglecting if I didn't say um, that there's also UCIPM uh, website. Jack Kelly Clark is a great photographer and has, has provided a lot of good photos. And I did use some of those for the pests. So thank you to the sponsors. You've seen them and I know Julie um, shows them to you. So I won't hang in there, but thank you again. We really appreciate you guys. And then we look forward to seeing you in the garden. So with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you all for coming and watching. Ruth, that was terrific. And it was a great way to end the day with the beautiful tour of your garden and to see all the amazing images and videos you showed us. It was just lovely. And I know I've had the luxury of being in your garden once or twice and it, it's truly magical. So I'm glad you walked us through Bearded Iris. Well, thanks, Iris today. Appreciate you facilitating. Um, Absolutely, it's been fun. Yeah. So you actually answered the questions that came up oh. and, and then we just have one more, which is why are rhizomes so expensive to buy for bearded irises? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so there, there are not a lot of hybridizers around and this is their business. It takes years to produce uh, a, a successful plant that's going to be introduced into iris culture. Uh, and so I was showing you a little bit about how to hybridize if you wanted to take your own pollen and, and uh, kind of mix it with, you know, put it on the stigmatic lip of another one and get yourself some seeds. I've had seed pods that have 40 seeds in them. Those would each have to be planted out, grown for a number of years, and then uh, wait and see if when they bloom, if they bloom well, and then compost the ones you don't like. So it takes years of time for these guys to come up with these. And, and they, um, they are very expensive to start with and they get less as the years go by. As they get older, the cost goes down for them. There you go. So an initial invest investment, but things will get better. Are they, uh, um, the Iris Society, um, we do have a rhizome sale in uh, mid July. And I would encourage people to come and, and take a look at, we have baskets and baskets of irises set out with pictures uh, that people can look at. So that just happened last month. Yeah, right? it just happened. Okay. But put, mark your calendar. It's always yeah. 2022. It's always irises in July. Yeah, irises um, in July. Here's another question that just came through. Can you grow irises from seed and how? So you can, um, but you never know what you're going to get, especially now um, with all the hybridizing that's been done for so many years. There is a, um, there, the genetics is so complicated inside an iris that you might take your purple, your two purple irises and hybridize them and come up with a yellow, pink, broken flat. You know, you just don't know what you're going to get. And, and that is an interesting point too, that I meant to bring up. Uh, irises, when we, we sell them as rhizomes, which are clones of the, of the plant. So that means that you will get what you, what you buy. If you started from a seed or your seed pod, you, you might have a seed pod in your yard, it falls to the ground and it might grow and you might get another flower there that you might like, but it, you might go, gosh, I bought a purple iris, now I have a yellow iris. So I think it's important to like take the seed pods off if you don't intend to hybridize them and, and take the time to do that. Got it. Um, and should rhizomes, should we dust rhizomes with pesticide before planting? No, it's not necessary. Okay. And then how would you plant the seeds if you wanted to do that? That's a whole nother topic. Like Florianne said in her last presentation, yeah. we yeah. could go into another hour of that. That would take too much time, more than we have now. But I would, um, I would highly recommend contacting the um, American Iris Society, uh, they have a great website and, um, or the Sacramento Iris Society and uh, putting questions out there and, and they can be directed to people that could help with that. 
And there are great books out there too. Perfect answer. And then uh, we'll end with a bit of trivia somebody gave us. Um, <laughs> they wanted us to know that Iris is the Greek goddess of the rainbow. And yes. some suggest that the wonderful color spectrum of these flowers are the reason for their name. That's exactly correct. That is exactly right. So that's a nice little way to end. Yeah. Ruth is also, besides being our resident bearded iris guru um, in the program, she's also the one of the project leaders in our herb garden out at the Ferrop Sports Center. So we hope you will come out again, plug in it one more time, September 11th for the open garden from nine to 11. And who knows, you might find Ruth there and, and be able to ask her some more bearded iris questions or herb questions or anything else because she's a, a pretty darn good gardener. She'll have answers to a lot, so. Well, I wanted to let people know that the herb area has been completely redone and we have a beautiful new memorial gate dedicated to Chuck Ingalls who passed away recently and was uh, just got our whole horticulture center started. So please do come out and check out our, our beautiful area and do ask questions. We're just, we're there and we love to talk about plants. Yes, the installation of the Chuck Ingalls Memorial Gate offered up a, a way to expand the herb garden in a really lovely way. So it's, it's really, really nice out there. Ruth, thank you so much for being our, our end sweep of sessions today. It was fabulous. <laughs> thank really you. Nice job. So to end, I just wanna thank all the master gardeners who worked so hard to make this virtual harvest day as spectacular as it's been, and particularly Kathy Stewart and Mary Welch, your co-coordinator um, job has been amazing this year, just like it was last year to switch gears so quickly. And they're the ones who did most of our video work behind the scenes with our speakers. Um, thanks to Judy McClure, without Judy as our coordinator, we would not get much done. And amazing thanks to Fred Hoffman, Greg Gayton, Bill Cresha, Quentin Young, Lori Ann A. Asmus, and Ruth Ostroff for taking some time this morning to be here with us to present some lovely material, answer Q&A, and, and, and see us through all this. And then one final look at our sponsors, because again, without our sponsors, we don't get much done. So thank you to all our sponsors for supporting us over the years. Please consider coming out to our open garden. Remember the well is always open. We also keep out, keep, keep an ear and eye out because the master gardeners are gonna start getting back in the community once we get some pandemic relief. We'll show up at events like home shows and plant clinics and nursery and farm to fork. And so, so you'll see us in our tent more often out in the community. Um, once the pandemic kind of calms down a bit. And then I hope the screen switches. I have a little delay in switching the slides, but I wanted to show you one more time all the links. I'm actually gonna stop share and do it again. This way. wanted to remind you that we have a website, we have a Facebook presence, we have our email where if you didn't get your question answered today or you want more information, please email us. And also through the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management website there. And a reminder that Saturday, September 11th, 9 to 11, we'll be out at the Open Garden. And I would just like to thank all our attendees, everyone. We are now concluding our harvest day for 2021 virtual and this entire event was recorded and will show up on our website in the next week or so. Thank you all, happy gardening.